Golight presents the Talking Bollocks podcast. The hip knocker. Christmas is almost here, and if you're looking for a gift for someone special or to treat yourself, then check out some of the big offers coming from Manscaped on Black Friday and Cyber Monday. As you know, Manscaped have been supporters of this podcast for a good while now, and they tell us plenty of you have been getting on board and trying out the Manscaped products using the GoLow20 promo code to get 20% off. Have you been using the kit the lads at Manscaped sent us? Keeping yourself as fresh down there as you keep the rest? What do you think? Of course we have. You can't be letting things down there get out of hand. What about you? You're always going on about getting laced up. You been doing any lacing up down there? What do you think, bro? Fresh. And it's not just the trimmers either, is it? No, there's loads of stuff you can get, including some very comfortable boxers. The boxers 2.0, they call them. You using them, bro? Changed me life, bro. If you want to make someone in your life as happy as Terence, get yourself over to manscaped.com this Black Friday and Cyber Monday to pick up some bargains. Turn your package into the full package with Manscaped and don't forget to use the promo code GOLOW20 to get 20% off. Boom, episode 99 of the Talk and Bollocks podcast brought to you by GOLOW. It's me, Terry Flower. It's me, CLB. And this week we're joined by... It's me, Maverick Sabre. Maverick, <laughs> hey, 99, fucking... that's a, Hopefully that's a lucky number here today. Yeah, yeah this is going to be a big one regardless, yeah, Maverick. Yeah, the yeah, man yeah. managing yeah, with us today, yeah. but uh, how's things? How are you keeping? Good, good, yeah. In preparation for the for the re-release of the first album, 10 years on, and just getting everything ready around that. and Yeah, it's been good. It's exciting. So flat out, basically. Flat out, yeah, yeah. But good flat out, you know. It's nice to kind of go back into this project and relive some of the songs and the moments of it and kind of like bring that back and bring it on tour and you know get it back in people's ears again it's gonna be blade and quality when it started uh that's out on the sort is in november straight in plugs are off yeah you really come on straight off the bat yeah. we've got more plugs coming don't we? <laughs> <laughs> more plugs and an adapter that fella yeah we yeah, were only yeah. saying we were outside we were struggling none of us know what to fucking call you what? Yeah, I know what we're outside. I was saying, fuck it, let's just make up something. Call me Brenda or something. For <laughs> Sandra, he said. He said, just call me Sandra. Yeah, so yeah, Mav, Mick, whatever you, whatever you fancy. Where did Maverick come from, Maverick Saber? Uh, my initials are MS. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I remember when I was about 14 and I was setting up a MySpace page for everyone who remembers the MySpace pages. Uh, <laughs> and I wanted to pick a name to kind of match the music. So Maverick, someone who thinks outside the box, I was like, yeah, sweet. And Sabre, the meaning I found for it at the time was someone who puts on a hard in front to get through hard times. I don't know where I found that meaning, but it ended up sticking. And once I had that little URL of myspace.com forward slash Maverick Sabre, it just fucking, it just stuck. Yeah. How old were you when you made that? Uh, 14. You were a lost matter at 14 than yeah, I was, you know yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, 14, 15. We couldn't even spell my own name at 14. <laughs> I was thinking. struggling, that's why we went with Maverick Sabre. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's a blatant deadly name. I was on the way in here and I was like, I wish my name was fucking Maverick, you know that? Now, I always used to get shit like, so are your parents French? I was like, hey, French, are you, were they Star Wars fans? Were they Top Gun? Top Gun fans is the biggest thing. Yeah. Everyone thinks my mum and dad were just crazy fucking Tom Cruise Top Gun fans. I'm like, all right, if that's, if that's what you want to think, we'll just go with that anyway, fuck it. Yeah, it's a quality name though, it is. Nah. Little. So I'm just going to call you Mav. Mav's grand, yeah. Because yeah, we'll stick with Mav, yeah. Yeah, Mav works. Or San, I'll call you Sandry, yeah. Sandry, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Right, boom, what have we got? We have singles, do we? Do, do we? we have a fucking zinger? That's the question. I haven't known singers in weeks. Oh, no, we're struggling. With... Do you know what, Maverick? <laughs> I asked a good question there. Who did I ask this question? Neil Delamere. Mm. So I asked a good question, yeah? And I'd like to get your answer on it. Yeah, on. So if you could go back to any moment in time, mm. in the history of the earth, mm. where would you go back to? I'm a bit of an old school hippie, so bring me back to Woodstock. What was that 1969? 69, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. What's yeah. that? Woodstock, Woodstock Festival. Yeah. It's just like yeah. the Summer of Love. Summer of Love, Jimi Hendrix. Yeah. You know what I mean? That that, go back that, there, that festival. Go back experience. Chest hair out, bloody LSD. Yeah, <laughs> long hair. Psychedelic yeah. music. You know what I mean? I'd like to experience that because it felt like that little, what was it called? Like the Summer of Love or yeah. whatever it was. And that just felt free and people were kind of like, you know, there was politics in music. There was psychedelic shit in music. It was like people coming together. It was a free festival. That kind of feel, that era I would like to experience. How many people was that there? I think it was a half a million people or something like that. Matt, did you ever see the, the pictures of it, Terry? No. Oh. Nah, it was mental. It, it was 
Dude. That sounds late. That, 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 that all on one. I'm pretty sure it was all on one stage. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it, was it wasn't a concert. Stage. It was just playing. It's like a city full of people just, just chilling city out. Full yeah, of people coming and you had like I think who opened the stage it was Richie Haven opened it and it just like went from that to like you know um canned heat and you know all the different acts that kind of came on throughout the night and it was yeah like, yeah did you see the documentary about uh woodstock 99 yeah, yeah fucking hell yeah, yeah yeah that was like electric picnic this year <laughs> <laughs> with the rain i'm telling yeah, you yeah well when they and well, what were they expecting though i feel like right from the get-go you could see that that was going to be a, yeah. like, a disaster like you know, oh, did you not watch it? It was on Netflix. No, oh, mate. nah, it's an interesting watch. It's a bit like another take on what was that other one with um, Firefest? Uh, Firefest, yeah. yeah, it was it's like just... a 99 version of that, kind yeah. of. Yeah, it's just a cash grab. These fellas, like Cowboy, tried to set up a festival and hadn't a clue what they were doing, and things just fell apart from day one. and it was a three-day festival. Yeah, and I can't remember. There was one band that they told to go on stage. and was like, yeah, can you just calm down? Chili Peppers. Who was it? Yeah, it was, oh, was the Chili, Chili Peppers, Peppers, yeah. And they didn't. They just fucking, everyone just went even more mental. Yeah, man came out in the nip. He's like, go out and calm the crowd <laughs> yeah. down. They're starting fires. Your man came out in the nip and he played that song. It was called Fire. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Placed on a blazer. Yeah, placed on up and fucking flames, but yeah. Did you ever That's play a Anta? Right answer, but yeah. that's elite Alanta. You know what I mean? Mm. I thought you were going to say the fucking Troubles or something. <laughs> 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 you know what I mean? That would be fucking bring us into another conversation. But, <laughs> but yeah. Did you ever play any world crowds? Uh, yeah, there's been wild things that have happened at shows. Scotland's always been a pretty fucking... They're a wild crowd. I remember doing Tea in the Park in 2013. and I remember that particularly, the crowd were... You know, amped up's one way to put it, but they were they were pretty loose. Uh, Scottish crowds, for me anyway, from my experience, have always been the maddest crowds. Like, uh, but yeah, you see mad shit at gigs from scraps. I used to have this point in my set, and I never knew why, but it was during like the end of 2012, start of 2013, when we were touring Lonely Out of Brave for the first time properly. <clears throat> it was like between the fourth and fifth tune, and it's like a six eight ballad, a song called I Can Never Be. Yeah. Like a love song, right? Between that and a song called Cold Game, which is still kind of chilled out, but every time there was that little gap in the set, there'd be a scrap. There'd be hands down, whether we in Swansea or London or shit like that. So I'd always, I never liked scraps at my gigs. It's yeah. Like, one, it distracts from the fucking show. And then two, it's like, that's not the environment my, I want my music to give off. It's like, nah, lads, if you're going to scrap, just leave it outside. This is supposed to be a little space where we're all singing together here. And I had to break up a couple of fights and. My tour manager, I hated it, but every now and then, if someone was ultra leery, getting someone kicked out of a venue full of a couple of thousand people is difficult. You've got to yeah. have security come through the crowd. They are being leery. Next minute, the show stopped for 10 minutes. So I'd normally bring people on stage, tell them to calm down, and sit them to the corner. So, Can I the ball corner? so yeah. some, sometimes you'd have, like, one of my shows, you'd have a fella sitting in the corner after three songs, like, he's on the fucking naughty step, like, just sit, swaying his head in the corner. My, t my tour manager would be looking just to make sure that he's not... <laughs> but, yeah, so they, they were normally the, the wildest shit that happened in my gig. So if you want the VOP experience at your gig, just start swinging aimlessly. Just start swinging aimlessly, yeah. yeah. You might get dragged on stage. Yeah. yeah, put on a naughty step. You might not be able to dance that much, but you can fucking... <laughs> you get sideline views, fucking hell. Yeah, but uh, our gigs... Our gigs are nuts as well. Our, our gigs. Mate, yeah, our we gigs do gigs as well, Maverick, yeah. No, I, I, I'm having a bit more rock and roll. I want you to come to one of yours and get a throw no, the but, slaps and get put on the naughty. No, I, <laughs> Someone to throw a few slaps back, I wouldn't do that. Uh, our crowds are fucking nuts as well, but surprisingly, there's never a fight. But they're up on fucking tables, they want to hear over. There's all sorts going yeah, on as yeah. well. But, but how does it feel from the transition from this to live shows? Because I know how it feels like, as a musician from when you make shit and you've got people in in the room like this and you play it and there's 10 people in the room and it's exciting and then next minute you bring it out and people know the song and there's energy what's mm. it feel like for you's going but that's what we, do you know what I've, I've said this to Calvin a few times it's a little bit different I'd imagine than like comedians and singers and stuff like that because they're going out and they're doing what they know it's almost like a set yeah like they, they've their song the singers have their song you've rehearsed it you've yeah, yeah, you yeah, crafted yeah, yeah. it there's We're, a certain bit of looseness but it is yeah, pretty yeah. it's going this way and you've perfected struck. the craft yeah, you know yeah, what they're yeah, going yeah. like you're going on, you're gonna like, oh, can we try this one again? I, I didn't get that right, and then you're gonna go and play that like three hours later. Whereas I'm going out and like, right, Terence, tell that story about the time you had tonsillitis. Yeah, yeah or, or, or that's a walking out, and then like, it's like, 
like a, a lot of the Wednesday gig was about how mad the Sunday gig was. <laughs> so it's not like we had this plan that was like on Sunday there was cunts looking for Kelly Harrington skull medal to do sniff off and I you know what I mean? Yeah, the crowd yeah. is gonna bleed nuts like but a lot of it is off the cuff and like it's sort of so it's nerve wracking, like yeah. you know what I mean? Oh, they'll be rattling going out. But the fucking it's proper the transition course, yeah. is unbelievable. We yeah. we sort of say like especially because we only did our first live show in March. Yeah. So in March it was almost like we were just fucking launched into it. Yeah. It was like we announced we were doing a live show and we were like, Oh, this is great, we're all in good form and we're like, Oh, we should talk about this out of blah 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 and then before you know you're behind the curtain and you've thirty seconds and you're walking on stage and you're like what the fuck do we do? Yeah. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And it's yeah. sink or swim. Yeah. Yeah. You know that type but of But that's way. it. But then uh, I think there's something to be learned off that because yeah. there's only certain things that come out of us because in essence you're performing as well, right? Yeah. And you're vibing off the crowd's energy to a certain degree. You're reading the crowd. Yeah. Like if a subject doesn't go down well or doesn't get any response, I can imagine you're ready. You've got yeah. stuff in the, yeah. in the background. So that's what we do. We always just have like one or two stories sitting there and it's like if we come to a standstill, just turn to that. Yeah, do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. But they, they just never seen they even go to sense though. Yeah. You know, like the crowd doesn't care. I was saying this already, man, like, yeah, I was talking about this before these two shows. At this live show in August, I was halfway through telling the story, yeah, and I just went blank and I didn't know what I was saying. <laughs> like, and I thought in front of 1,200 people. Yeah, yeah. And I was just like, oh, bollocks, I don't know what I was saying there, yeah, and they're all laughing and celebrating. Because and they've come there for you, so yeah. that's part of it. And it's yeah. just like, I think sometimes part of these live shows, and it's the same for you, same as musicians, is like people come to see you. Yeah. Right? So as much as the show might have a sheen to it and oh, it's prepared, they also want to see moments like that because that's the unique shit because they can watch stuff on YouTube over and over again. Yeah. But they only get that unique experience once. So like 100%. sometimes I've even found that if I'm doing a show and I try and say this to like any younger artists because obviously shit's changed now. It's like you put one song out, it blows up. Next minute you're in front of fucking two thousand people. It's like you don't have that room to go and start in a room full of 10 people get booed and do shit wrong and there's a lot of pressure i think the the mistakes element of it is part of it mm. people come into it and they're like ah oh, i've had a unique experience because they fucked up a song and they interacted with me a bit more or whatever it may be i feel like yeah that's it that's the beauty of live shows mm. yeah and then that must make you feel even more comfortable coming back into this space because this space is a breeze then. Yeah. yeah. Not fucking 1,200 people. Marvel. Like, it, it's exactly. weird when you say yeah. that though because I'm like, there's more pressure on us now because we're oh, just entertaining man. you. If that makes sense because I'm like, we have to be in because he's going to be waiting on us and we have to do this because he has places to be. Okay. Yeah, if that makes sense yeah, whereas yeah. when you're on stage on the live show it's like you're on your time Yeah, you know okay. what I mean you're going to be on that stage yeah. no matter what yeah, whereas yeah. I'm like shit we have to get in here there's someone waiting there's one person waiting on you yeah, which is yeah. I know that sounds weird I think I'm about to butcher in that because there's a room full of 1200 yeah, people yeah 1200 people the only thing we yeah. think there's 1200 cunts waiting yeah. Yeah. we better be on stage at 8 o'clock <laughs> yeah, yeah. and we better be ready but to with go. your way of thinking it's like oh but there's, there's it's more, more personal it's, yeah, source, isn't it yeah. Yeah. maybe that adds a little bit more of intensity or something yeah because the way I look at it is you don't have to be here Yeah, you know what I mean Like it's not as if we gave here's 500 quid come on in like you just literally come in I, mean, I, thought I, was, the I thought I was coming in for <laughs> <laughs> I'm on. Fuck. No, no, yeah. no. He plugs no. his album, he's going to leave now. <laughs> I'll take 200 and fuck off. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, um, yeah, live shows anyways. Yeah, the live yeah. shows went well. Yeah. Yeah. Shout out to everybody by coming, yeah. honest to God. They were probably tough. The, the Wednesday was probably the best. The Sunday was unbelievable. Yeah. Could, went much better than I expected them to go. Um so yeah, that's all I have to say. I don't really know what to say, you know what I mean? You know when you're sitting back after, like even our producer rang me today and he was like, like, how are you feeling now? And I'm like, I don't, I don't think, I can't even put it into words, like, yeah. you know what I mean? Because usually I just come down off them and I'm like, that done now, when's the next one? But I know what what done with life shows till next year sometime now, so I'm just like, I'm, I'm still on a high, like, I'm still riding the wave, like. And have you got a different buzz off that? Because I know what it's like for us when we come off tour. Yeah and you've been performing in front of people, there's a buzz when you perform in front of yeah. that many people, right? And you get them reactions, laughing, or whatever the interaction is. Do you find that, like, from coming from this to shows, now after the shows, there's an extra buzz, because you're like, oh, fucking hell, that... I've just taken that vibe off the energy of the crowd yeah. <clears throat> for however long. So yeah. the dump, like the dump of like the the emotion and yeah, everything. We call it like tour blues. Like yeah. come home, yeah. you've just been different cities, different cities. Next minute you're sat in your living room and you know you're only screaming at yourself in the mirror. Yeah, yeah, No, yeah, I, I, I know what you're saying, but I have that all that sense of like, it's like when we we've done five live shows this year, but it feels like when we're done, when we announce the next one a fucking week later, and it's like I'm all I'm. 
going to bed that night thinking, oh, we've a live show in eight weeks, yeah. oh, blah, blah, blah. So now it's like, I actually have that bit of time to not be worrying about a live mm. show now, and I'm just, I'm content with it. Yeah. And I'm happy with the last two. We signed off the year on a very high note. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We know that, however, what, 2,400 people are over the two shows, we know that they want to come back, yeah, you know right, what I mean? Right. Everybody mm. left happy, so I'm, I'm just content with it all now. Yeah. I actually had this deep conversation with someone the other day because he messaged me about it, and you're like, what's the, like, the, the high, like, and then do you, do you, like crash because the dump and everything and I was like you know what I think because the very first live show we done right for some reason everybody that was involved I was like this is how this show was going to go mm -hmm. and it went that way mm -hmm. and I know that might sound arrogant to some people but in my head I just knew the format we were going with the guests we had lined up I knew what we were capable of doing and then after he was like that was deadly one I was like but I knew it was going to do it mm -hmm. I knew it was going to be like that mm -hmm. so now I'm thinking am I kind of numb to getting them highs because the force went so well but I knew it was going to go that well mm. that I'm just used to it now. You yeah, know, like that's you've weird. Got, you've gone into like a bit of walk mode in it that yeah. you understand what needs to be delivered of a gig and you know what can come out of it and you just... I suppose it's like back to... <clears throat> musicians, I suppose it's like us ultra pre preparing our shows and, and knowing, all right, even if this has a little flagging moment, this tune's going to get people going, and this is. So you come off going, all right, yeah. yeah. Even though the crowds may vary, you have a little set moments in it that you're like, all right, I'm I'm pretty secure at this. You know? Yeah, but, so that sort of the fellow I was having the conversation with, I said, am I coming across a bit arrogant? And he goes, well, no, I think you sound confident because yeah. you're prepared. Yeah. And I was like, well, I suppose we are prepared because we've done fucking five of the live shows. We're on 99 podcasts. I think it's fair to say we know what we're doing. Yeah. So maybe this is like this is the preparation. So now all they have to do is transition this from here to a stage. Right. So what's the difference, yeah. you know? And it's not arrogance as well. I think it's like, it's arrogance if you need to fucking tell every person you met about how, you know what I mean? But mm. yeah. confidence is, it's like that barrier, that, that kind of thin line between, oh yeah, that's a bit arrogant. And, but confidence, it's like a fighter going, I'm going to knock him out in a second. Yeah. And you go and knock him out in a second. It's like, yeah. that's what we should be doing going yeah. into live shows or fights or mm. podcasts or live podcasts, or whatever it is. We should have that confidence because that, we have to get yeah. up on stage the and thing perform is, or something. We'll never say, we'll never be like, oh, this is how great we are, or blah, blah, none yeah. of that shit, but because a lot, especially with live shows, a lot of it, and in here, is about our guests. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. not about us, like, yeah. like it is, of course it is, people You're are paying to see us at the live shows, and <clears> we don't announce who the guests are, so it's all a surprise, so they're, yeah. they're literally buying the tickets just based off me and Cam, but we know going in that, like, we're confident with the guests that we picked, that the stories are going to be good, and that the, the listeners are going to enjoy it, so it's like, it's on us to be like, yeah, we're confident, and, and we're happy with it, but it's, it's about the guests, like, we're, we're picking the guests, and then we're like, they're going to show up, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? So it's yeah. not all about us, yeah. do you get me? Yeah. But yeah, the live shows are sick. Yeah. Nah, that's exciting. Yeah. That's and yeah. do you know what? I was saying this to you earlier on. It's nice to be able to bring what I think about the kind of like popularity of podcasts at the moment is interesting that people are back to listening to long form conversations. Yeah. It's like as much as everyone complains about the young generation only listen to songs that are a minute and a half and the you know, quick TikTok generation. It's like people still do want to listen to long form conversations and debates or just, you know, bringing yeah. people into your living room and your space of like, you know, kind of general conversation. I just think that's that's beautiful for young, for, for young kids to be getting back into that. Not even just young kids, but just people in general back to listening to yeah. full form conversations. You know? Yeah, because it's just... a wide range of people as well. It's like... It's diverse. Yeah, in terms of even ages and stuff yeah. like that. But we have got a lot of young kids listening. The thing is, there's young kids listening and they're just looking at us as just two normal young flesh, do you yeah. get me? And we're just sitting down having a conversation. And I think that's why like, it's doing well for us, you know what I mean? Because the kids are just listening going, oh, we know a fella like them too, yeah. and you know what I mean? And it's just normal conversation. It's yeah. not all political, it's yeah. not all this, not all that. It mm. just goes wherever the conversation goes and that's yeah. it. And people seem to enjoy it. Well, that's the that's the, once you've got people that can relate to you, I feel like that's the most inspiration thing, isn't it? Once they can mm. see themselves in that, then like it opens up everything for everyone. Mm. Big time, yeah. Nice. Have you got anything else to talk about? Uh, I want to touch on what happened on Wednesday night. I told Terence already, so uh, yeah. that I was going to talk about this. So Maverick, we done a done a live show in August, right? Yeah. And. Uh, <laughs> In our live shows, we wear suits. Shout out to Dipney, who sort us out with the suits, what, right? Fitted suits, yeah. Yeah, so after the show, me and my two mates, I don't, we don't drink, so I was driving, and uh, we were going back to the house party, and we got stopped by the police. Now, it was in a nice area, so we got stopped by the police, and I'm driving, and I look for my licence, my licence in the back. Long story short, they were like, what, what's the story with you wearing a suit and all? 
Like, what's going on here? And then I had to explain <laughs> where I was. I had to do on a live show, blah, blah, blah. I do a podcast, this, that, and the other. And I was like, right, wherever. So I'm driving home on Wednesday. Myself, the missus, and one of my mates going back to me gaff. Still and in I, the suit? Still in the suit, yeah. yeah. This from Wednesday night. And uh, we're talking about how the show went, yeah. Blue lights come on in the mirror. And I was like, what the fuck is going on here? And I was like, we're getting stopped. Please pull up beside me and goes, uh, pull in there. I'm grand. And he goes, you're going a bit fast. And I goes, no, it wasn't. I was like, if I was going too slow. Uh, and he says, uh, you were speeding down the North Circular Road. I hadn't even, I was nowhere near the North Circular Road. I came from the complete opposite direction. I goes, no, I wasn't even on the North Circular. And he's like, yeah. well, you were speeding down this road. Have you got your license? So I got out and the two of them are standing there and they're like, where are you coming from? I was like, oh, I was in Vicar Street. And they were like, oh, who was on? I was like, oh, he was. So then I had to explain again <laughs> what the story is. And it really, really bothered me because I'm thinking to myself, like, there's one thing getting stopped for being a young player driving a golf, yeah. yeah. And then there's another thing having to explain yourself for wearing a suit for being a young player has to wear a suit. Mm. So it really bothered me because this is a prime example. And we always talk about police yeah. and their negative experiences with them. Yeah. But I had one positive experience recently, and I highlighted that. And I was like, that's the first time in I don't know how long, probably ever, I had a positive experience with the police. Yeah. And now it's had to get outweighed again by another negative experience. So what that was is a prime example of profiling discrimination and over policing mm. I got stopped by the police for fucking nothing yeah. you're saying I was speeding on a road I wasn't even driving on yeah. they took me licence had a look who I was make me explain myself at what I'm wearing I should be able to put a suit on in the morning and go get a coffee and not have to explain yourself exactly and you know that, uh, what, what have your experiences been like growing up with the police and that's been the overall this yeah. is the overall narrative where we're from is there's a young fella don't like the car he's driving yeah. where's he getting the money from yeah. this that and the other that's why I think I was pulled over in the first place because it was an unmarked car so there's no way of telling what speed I was going. Yeah. I was a van I was going too slow. Yeah. If they had to put me in and said you were going too slow I would have agreed. They said you were speeding down the road I didn't even drive down and then I had to explain myself why I was wearing a suit. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, yeah. yeah. So, we, I know we highlight a lot and people say that we, we bash the guard on this podcast but this is why, this is what we're living through. You but, know what I mean? And I think it's like these are your experiences as well and if there's mm. ever a place to discuss these experiences and exactly what you were saying, young people are looking up to you going, I see myself in them. They mm. probably are having these experiences too and we need to discuss these things in conversations like this mm. rather than little snippets where we can't delve into. It's like, nah, these need to be heard, these points of view and your experiences because, you know, things like that can't go unquestioned, you know, and can't, yeah. you know, and these experiences are fucking, they're important to be heard, mm. you know, and especially for young people who feel like, might feel isolated by these experiences and feel like, you know, everyone feels sometimes when things happen to them that they are going through them themselves or it's mm -hmm. just on them. When you open up these conversations and go, all right, you know, it's not about you know, bashing, you know, the police in, 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 you know, totality, but any any organisation has to have some criticism that comes up against it. Mm. We have to have critical thinking when we go into discussing these organisations or else people are free to do what the fuck they want. And I yeah. So I know there's a lot of police that actually listen to this podcast yeah. and someone will come to the live show. Someone will come to the live show. Like this is what we actually, yeah. in that show, we actually said, we know there's police in the crowd. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? And we we thought that was funny. It's a bit ironic. We get it. Yeah. No problem with it. Like, yeah. they're perfectly the entitled to come. Well, you said, a minute ago because people say we bash the guard or something. We don't bash the guard and this like you said there, we're talking about experiences that happen to us. Yeah. That's if if you want to call that bashing, okay, that's all well and good. But it's not bashing if it ever happened. Yeah. We're just saying yeah. what happened and then if you're saying we're bashing, well then like I don't know what to really say about that. Like I've had a I've had an awful lot of negative experiences with the guard since yeah. this podcast started because of the podcast and a cop are pulling me and saying to me, Well you're always giving a stick on the blade podcast and whatever and I say, No I'm not Giving you a stick on the podcast, I'm talking about what's about to happen, and you're another copper now, are they? You know what I mean? And even more so, that's f it that feeds into what you're saying, feeding, isn't that playing into what you're yeah. discussing already? Like. It's the whole point, I, and even then, and th that cop, I was like, I go, well, you're still listening to the podcast, so I don't listen to the podcast. How do you know we pass this thing? Yeah, 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 you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, but it's yeah. stupid little things like that. But in saying that, in the last two weeks, I've had two coppers following me saying I love the podcast and just yeah. walking off. So I was like, look, there's always a balancing, but yeah. I, think, yeah. I, I don't, I never think telling it's a dangerous place you get into if people say that telling people's true experiences is bashing or mm. anti this and anti that yeah. it's like well you need to express ourselves you know what yeah. I mean if it's off no facts and you're just bullshitting then yeah alright yeah. it's bashing because you're making shit up but if it's off true experiences like people need to know these experiences yeah. and whether you're like whether you're a decent cop or, or not 
you need to hear these fucking experiences mm. to change something. You know what I mean? So that, we've had coppers pulling us and apologising about other yeah. coppers. So that's and like, we know to what's going on. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I know you apologise on, on their behalf and something. We're like, you don't fucking apologise. You didn't do yeah. anything wrong. Nah, and that must be tough for them because they're obviously potentially walking in an institution that exactly is constantly there fighting yeah. their own morality in as well. Yeah, I mean? so yeah. that's what I'm, I'm trying to do. I'm trying to highlight this to the, the guys that are listening yeah. and be like, look, if your colleagues are carrying on like this, call out because yeah. you know what's wrong. Yeah, yeah. Like, I'm, I have no criminal conviction, never been involved in crime. I work hard for everything that I have. Cars taxed and insured, I have a full licence. It's my car. Everything, clean as a whistle. Yeah. Doesn't stop me getting pulled over and dragged over. Yeah, you know what I mean. It's kind of the same. Like there's a there's a big thing in the last couple of years in England about, um, especially in London, with the Met Police being called out over racism, sexism, classism, and all that stuff, and just corruption in general. Um, and you know, again, these discussions have to be brought to the forefront to be solved. It's yeah. like, oh, what, we keep quiet about stuff and then nothing ever changes and exactly. the institutions protect themselves and it's like, well, nah, you want to better things, you want to move things forward, you want to change things. But sometimes the angle's taken of even if you highlight these things, oh, you're anti this and it's anti that, it doesn't need to be that this way or that way. It's like, nah, you need to change things and we need to have these discussions and openly. And if you're trying to shut down discussions, which happens a lot now, then it's like, well, where do we go with Where's it? You just anger yeah. people. Mm. And in fact, you you create the divide even more yeah. simply yeah. between yeah. police them away, and yeah. the general public if you don't have these discussions. If you have them, you can solve something, but if you don't, the police end up getting worse because they just like, you know, the people who are specific to that end up gravi gravitating towards that institution because they then feel safe in it. Yeah. And then if, you know, and then on the other side, the general public feel like they're not protected and not spoken for. So, yeah. Now, I think it's good that you're using your podcast for mm. stuff like that. Yeah. I shouldn't have to. That's nah, all I'm saying. No, nah, you shouldn't yeah. have to, but you know what? And the same with music. It's not like, look, I don't ever think that anyone needs to take a responsibility of speaking about anything socially, politically or anything. You can, you know, we could just be sitting here and talk about football or whatever like that, or I could just be singing love songs my whole life. But I think there is a duty when you have a voice that you have to be broad and, you know, speak about your experiences. It doesn't, doesn't always need to be about negative experiences, mm -hmm. but if that's part of your life and your, your story, then... You know, you got to be truthful about it because that's mm -hmm. the shit that people connect with the most. And mm -hmm. in that conversation, you could have just changed a young fella's night from listening to it. It could have been in the dumps about some shit that's happened to him with police yeah. or whatever. And then now he's connected with you and he's like, oh shit, someone else is out there mm -hmm. that feels the same way. And that, touching on that, that's, uh, I've obviously told a few people what happened because, like, it's ironic and it's funny. I was like, I actually got pulled after coming off the stage and that funny and I had to explain it. And people were like, you know, you don't have to explain yourself to the police. Mm. You've done nothing wrong, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, but I wanted to explain it to them. Mm. I'd be like, no, I'll tell you where I was. Mm. You know what I mean? So, like, make them feel like ticks then. And be like, oh, shit, like, what are we doing here? Like, what are we getting out of this? What have you done your whole career for to get up to this point to be stopping a fella and questioning him about his suit and questioning yeah. what he's done and he's telling you and he's being honest and you know he's you've pulled him over for nothing? It's like, what's that reflection? If, exactly, if you're you know. You're thinking that yourself. It's like, yeah. Hopefully change comes through that shit because, yeah. you know, the divide between between that and then the state and the and the general public is is you know if if we want solutions discussions need to be had that's it and that's it and it's a gap we're trying to bridge yeah if you know what i mean that's like, good though that's 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 what we should be using these platforms mm. for and it doesn't need to be heavy 24 7 no like you're saying it doesn't need to be politics and you know because that's not us we're not yeah we're not heavy 24 7 so but you need to have an element of it because mm. that's that's your true experiences and even you know it's it's mad the 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 irony of it happening after your show even okay. more so where you're in a suit it's like fucking hell it sounds like a bloody sketch do you know what I mean? it does, but, it does see the like thing is I, I actually I put a tweet up about it and someone called me a lawyer under the tweet yeah. I was like alright why would I lie about it I didn't respond but I was like Timmy Self I was like why would I lie about this like why would you like what do you think that's killer yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Like, if like, anything it's cringy yeah, yeah. You know I mean I'm like yeah, I can't believe I got yeah. pulled again yeah yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. It says more about me than anything else yeah. like, fucking get him <laughs> Yeah, on you. <laughs> yeah, that's what it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right, uh, enough talk about the guard. Yeah. Um, Maverick, mm -hmm. so what we do with every guest, just bring us back to the start, yeah? yeah? What was life like for you growing up? And Before we jump in, Terry, okay. do you know what we haven't done with a guest since probably in the <clears> 80s <throat> in the episodes? Oh. 
They're pissing the shower, ah. Maverick. They were pissing the shower. Fucking hell, lads. Is that That's an important about? question. Uh, yeah, have you ever got asked that before in an interview? Nah, nah, but really? I like it. Uh, <laughs> they were pissing the shower. Do you know what? Every now and then. Yeah. yeah. Every now and then I piss in the no, shower. That's yeah. good. Yeah, no. Depends how I'm feeling, but yeah. It shows us how honest the guest is yeah, because yeah, everybody nah, pisses every in the shower. I piss in the shower. Yeah. I don't do yeah. it all the time, but sometimes I do. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's all right, yeah. Yeah, well, 99 episodes, and we've had two people, I think, saying they don't. The lion bastards. But anyways. Yeah, I think that. It's, it's think a good it's, it's a, it's it's a nice little ice break. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. We did it 20 yeah. minutes in, but yeah. <laughs> 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 Got deep in about the guards. Next minute, do you piss in the show? <laughs> this I is what like, we no, do. That's the spectrum. This is what we do, mate. Yeah. Yeah. We're yeah. talking yeah. bollocks for a reason. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But anyways, Maverick, so take yeah. us back to the start of your life. <laughs> Where are you from? What was life like growing up? Uh, I was born in Stoke Newington in Hackney in London. My mum's second generation Irish. Uh, born and raised in Hackney. My dad's from New Ross in County Wexford, moved over uh, and was living and working in London. Met my mom, had me and my sister. We moved from Hackney in 94. My sister was five years older than me, and then we moved to New Ross in County Wexford, where my dad's family was from. I went to school there, was raised there. Um, I started my music career um, there. And I was... I was originally producing beats, like that's what I started off, like doing boom bap, hip hop beats and stuff like that. Then I was singing over them and rapping. I was mainly rapping at the time and I was only singing because there was no one else around me to sing. And my dad is a musician, so I was always brought up on like blues and bits of country and trad music and stuff. So I was always singing, playing the guitar anyway. And then stuff started to kind of kick start from there. Uh, obviously loads, loads of little bits in between, but... Then I moved over, I finished school at 16, moved over to London at 17. Um, ended up having to come back. I came back for my 18th birthday, got stuck here for a bit, and then came back at 19, and I've been in London ever since. So come here, what was it like moving from Hackney over here as an English young player over here then and skill and stuff like that? Was that? Yeah, it was a weird one because obviously you're brought up in an Irish family. Mm -hmm. And Irish families in London are Irish family, yeah. you know what I mean? So coming over and being like a little mix of the boat was a was an experience, you know what I mean? And I think like the experience of that forced me as years went on to find my identity more because I was so attached to London and we used to come back to London for summers and all my musical influences were coming from London and you know what I mean? I had cousins or my sister was always tuned into like Garage or Early Grime. So my musical influences were a mixture between like what was going on in London and then what I was listening to here. So really I was brought up more so on like, you know, Garage and Soul Solid Crew, yeah. Dynamite and Skinny Man and Klashnikov and all that. But then I was brought up on my dad's blues and I was hearing like, Jambala, Scott is proud, oh my deal. And I, I had that like, that little duality. Uh, and then, yeah, it was just more, I would say it was more so about like me finding my own, uh, own identity through that. And like, what did that mean for me? How did I sound? I came over with a bit of an English accent. My mom still had a ver still has a very strong English accent, and you know, going into school with a half Ross, half <laughs> English accent, and like finding my way through that. And uh, so, yeah, it was a beautiful thing. I think at the time, as a young fella, I, I found it hard to find my identity of yeah. what you know, because I was so connected to London, but then I was so connected to New Ross, yeah. and I was brought up there. Uh, and yeah, there's loads of different things. It was like. Not wait, we'll go into it. Fuck, we're on a podcast. Yeah, but, let's go. But uh, yeah, finding the duality of like London Irish. That's as I go, as I grew up, I realized that's the duality of where I am. I'm a Londoner, but I'm Irish, right? Mm. And I remember, you know, you get the same old shit and growing up. And that's like, what I was going to say. Did you get grief for having a London accent? Yeah, yeah, in, yeah, in definitely. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I had a teacher that used to call me late and Orient. Yeah. Fuck <laughs> sake. Yeah, yeah. When, when, I was, yeah. when I was in secondary school, but I didn't give a fuck about that. Like, yeah. I didn't really mind. Uh, and I remember the change, there was like, because uh, I used to even put on like a, a, an English accent really hard when I used to spit. I wanted to sound like Dizzy Rascal when I was younger. Mm -hmm. And I was still finding it. So while other people were doing American accents, I was trying to, because I was listening to Dizzy Rascal hard. Like, so I would put on like, so that, what, that, uh, and that, yeah. was, that was my vibe, yeah. And, uh, and I remember um, a fella called Dean Scurry from Ballymon. Um, who was working with Urban Intelligence at the time and was doing a youth centre, reached out to me on MySpace. He got me my first ever gig. Um, we know Dan. We know Dan well, know Dan, yeah. 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 So he got me my first ever gig when I was 14, 15 in Waterford. And he reached out to me. He was like, yeah, you sound very London, but then spoke to me on the phone. He was like, 
he said something to me like, and I remember this was one of the conversations that started to change my perspective. He was like, but you sound a bit like a culture. You <laughs> but you don't sound like that on the record. And that took a little, that took a couple of years to hit in because I was still like, nah, but I'm a Londoner, I can sound like this. But I wasn't, I was, I was from Ross, you know. Yeah. But obviously as a young fella and spitting, I didn't, I wasn't hearing, you know, there was a couple of Irish accents I was hearing, but because they felt stronger than mine, I kind of always dipped back into the English accent a bit, like finding myself, right? And and I remember he said that to me and I was like, I remember being outside of a little, a, a little pub out in some like country lane and him saying that to me on the phone. I was like, fucking hell, I don't know how to take this. No one's ever said that to me before, right? So there, that was a little transition point. Then when I moved back to London at 17, I remember I was in East London, I was in a pub. And, you know, I'd never been called a paddy or anything. I've always been called like the English kid or, you know, Leighton Orient or, you know what I mean? Whatever it was. And uh, and I remember being in a pub and I went up and ordered a pint and the fella beside me went like, you're not fucking paddy, are you, mate? Where are mm. you from then? And I was like, that was the first time anyone had called me a paddy. And he said it slightly aggressively, yeah? I could see the tone, the undertone of it, yeah? And that was another change in point. I was like, fucking hell, who the fuck am I then? Yeah, so you're feeling outcasted where you should be feeling at home in both places. To a certain degree, yeah. Obviously, there's still love. It wasn't like, you know, yeah. some sob was story. Some experience. But there was just the experience of the duality of like, I feel like maybe, you know, identity is a big thing for anyone growing up yeah some people have a more concrete experience of their identity and some people have a little mixed experience right of like where did they which world did they sit in or how did they sit in both and that was a turning point for me of like ah oh, fucking hell all right now i've got i can't let anyone else tell me who i am and who my experience what yeah. my experience is you have to decide I've got to find that shit yeah. myself and then that got me i was always into history and stuff so from like from that literally that conversation in that pub that ended up turning turning my head a bit and that kind of ended up finding, like, you know, what is my space of my identity? And it was London Irish and like, that got me back into the history of everything and just kind of informed me about who I was. I started to inform myself about who, who really I was, you know what I mean? Yeah, mm. yeah. And how did you grow in school, <coughs> academically? How did I go to yeah, school? Yeah, good. Uh, do you know what? I, I, I never liked school, to be honest with you, because I was always into music, so I was like... I was producing beats at 14, so I was going into school, being up for four or five o'clock in the morning, making beats and then having to go to school in the morning. And what age are we talking now with the beats and stuff? I started at about 13. Yeah, That's yeah. Young. 13, 14, I was making it on like Fruity Loops and Magic Music Maker, mm. um, little like small programs. Uh, so I always had that thing. And then I started gigging from, Dean got me my first gig when I was just 15. So I was still in school. So I was gigging while I was in school. So Friday night I'd come off, either my dad would drop me up or I'd get the bus up. And then we'd be doing, we used to do a place called, um, oh, what was the name of it? It was, uh, the, was it The Cellar? Do you remember The Cellar by uh, Bossaris? It was a small venue back there. Was At the back of Conley Station? Yeah, was it? Oh, no. No, at the back of Boss Aris, there was a there was a little venue there that used to do Irish hip hop nights, um, like Terrorist, uh, Reds or Jambo. Mm. They did nights. As you're going back, yeah, back, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we used to go up and um, and they were kind of <coughs> that's where I kind of learned to perform. I was doing little sets up there and I do it every couple of weeks or whatever. And what you did, are you rapping here? Or are you I singing? I was rapping. Yeah, yeah, I was rapping and a bit of singing, <coughs> but mainly rapping. I was only singing because. No one else was singing around me, so I'd, I used to sing my own choruses. But I was producing the beats and then rapping and coming up, and like I'd have my CD in the car and the little Walkman or whatever, and I'd be learning my shit and then go out performing and get either the last bus home or, or get a lift back. So I was in school while all that was going on. And then there was a group called Rap Ireland at the time, which was a group of DJs of like Frankie Jazz, DJ Ahmed, Mo K, and they were getting all the main support slots at the time. So any like US or UK rappers that were coming over, they were getting the block support slots as DJs. And what they used to do is they would bring on a couple of people and give like five minutes or 10 minutes. And so I was like still in school, 15, 16, and I was getting like, we supported G-Unit, Lloyd Banks, The Game, Plan B. And then I was going back into school the next day. <laughs> So I always, <laughs> I never liked school anyway. Yeah. So while I've got that going on on one side, I'm coming back into school and it's seeming even more pointless to me. There were certain subjects I liked, like English, obviously, because I'm a writer, so it was like English I enjoyed and history I always enjoyed. But yeah, apart from that, 
and they were the ones I did best in. Apart from that, I never really, nothing else really stuck with me. So you know, most guests that we have on say that to us when when they're starting their careers early, well, as early as you did. Like we've had footballers on who knew in their heads, I'm gonna be a fucking footballer. Yeah. And they're going on trials with United, and then having to come having back to in go and go to the school the next day. day. And you're yeah. like, you having a laugh? Might yeah. been talking to Alex Ferguson yeah, yesterday. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know if they listen to you giving out because of Roy Stockings on instead of yeah. Black. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, you get yeah. me? It's, it's similar to you. So you really knew what you wanted to do from an early. Yeah, early from age. an early age. Yeah, it was still blurry, obviously, because it was like. There's no d- there's the point no direct path. Yeah, yeah, it's not yeah. like, all right, I can quit school. Do this and you'll be here, yeah. You know, tarmac, you know, or there wasn't any like concrete part to how this is going to work out but I just knew it for myself because I was like this is the only thing that drives me so yeah so then that kind of I never liked school anyway so they just made everything a bit more pointless you know what I mean mm-hmm. but you know I just want to touch back on the whole thing about finding your identity I remember I seen yeah. it on I think it was soccer AM yeah. years ago yeah. like we're going back now a good while mm. and they were asking you where was your allegiances like and you were saying if I could, I'd wear a half and half yeah. Ireland and England jersey. Yeah, yeah. And I remember thinking at the time, like I know a lot of people would frown upon that because you're one or the other. And as you said, your man in the pub was like, you fucking Paddy or whatever. But like, yeah. I remember thinking, like, that's very brave thing to say on the telly. And I was like, it's actually very mature as well because you're like, they bought me home. Like, they both share me heart. Yeah, and I found a bit of the time as well why I probably wouldn't answer that now the same way, but I would no, nah, I wouldn't really. But that at the time, I felt like. I was getting pulled by a lot of them questions and they were looking for an answer that suited them. Yeah. And they were like, oh, this young kid's coming on, this young Irish kid, he's got allegiances to Hackney and stuff. Like, let's get him to say he would wear one jersey over the other and then yeah. make it something. Yeah, so it was a narrative point. So yeah, yeah. yeah. And, that, and that was like, that whole period of time was a bit of like, I never had media training or anything. And yeah. I remember doing an interview years and years ago, my one of my very first interviews and... When I listened back to it, it was like my first interview. I'd, I'd never been in that kind of process before. And I remember listening back to it and I rang the guy who interviewed me and I was like, you fucking prick. It was like, you, you cut up what I said and made me sound like a fucking idiot. Oh, no, but that's how you said it. And I was like, yeah, but you know you edited in a sort of way yeah. to fit what you wanted. And that always stuck with me. And then as time used to go on in them early like round of interviews... Because so, so, some of them interviews I used to turn up, and because I was on the fucking jolly, I was, like, turning up to them after nights out, no sleep, and I was doing, like, BBC breakfast, no sleep, partying, and I was just yeah. on a fucking... So I wasn't really tuned in, and I used to listen back to certain things, and I was like, all right, it's not about taking yourself too seriously, but at certain points I felt like I slacked a bit. Yeah. And I was, like, got caught out, and I was, like, didn't have pre-prepared answers. And everyone comes in with a narrative, you know. This is a different space, because it's not that. It's an open conversation. But yeah. when We're going to got... put this up to bits later. Everything you were saying now. But at the time, I was, like, yeah, trying to media train myself. So were it. you just trying to please nearly everyone that was listening with the half Ireland, half England thing, instead yeah. of having somebody sting you? Yeah, in a way, because I didn't realise even myself then of, like, Oh, it's London Irish identity that I have. Like, there's yeah. beautiful things about England that I love. I've been there for the last 11 years, you know. Like, you know, half of my family are English. I've got, you know, nothing against the people of England. I was mm. born there, you know what I mean? So, um, and there's loads of layers to that and the politics behind it and, and you know, the connection between the general population. Yeah. Is a completely different mm, thing. There's a big the division there, yeah. But obviously, to try and explain that on Soccer AM in 10 minutes is <laughs> yeah, a fucking not difficulty. You know? yeah. They're waiting for you to say the wrong thing or the right thing. Yeah. So, for me, it was more more about like as time goes on about yo know, what's your identity London Irish and there's yeah. elements of that that I connect both with you know? I have family like that as well who would have grown up in London and in Dublin you know what I mean and I'd say they resonate a lot with what you're saying because I can see a lot of them in you and the way you're going on mm. you know like that and when they're in London, the London accent comes out and then they're over here, they sound like they're from Bally Firm. Like, <laughs> yeah, 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 what the yeah. fuck is going on here? You yeah, know, like yeah, that? And yeah. when they're in England, they say they're Irish. And then when they're in Ireland, they say they're English. And I'm like, yeah. what, what's going on? It's, it's just mad. And as you're saying, you hit the nail on the head. You're not identifying with one. You are your own thing. You're London Irish. Yeah, yeah. And that's it. And I think, like, even going back into them questions of people saying, like, where do your allegiances lie? It's like, as time went on, I realised, and this is for, for all of us, of like, I think other people try and dictate what your identity should be or mm. dictate whatever it is, like, who you should call yourself. It's like, I mean, if you resonate with a bit of London, a bit of Ireland, or a bit of a, wherever you were fucking raised, then you find that yourself. It's like, it's easier for people to put in a, a little box, oh, yeah, he's this, and, yeah. you know... Label you. Yeah, and I remember, like, even coming up to... When I, when I got nominated for the 
for the Brits critic choice critics choice in 2012 getting asked like uh, so it's the Brits now you, you can be an international artist or what you want and I was like what do you mean well yeah like what do you identify as and I was like oh, fucking hell I'm London Irish and it was hard to to box me into something because then suddenly if I say I'm this I'm an international artist yeah. so it was all them little things in the background that kind of build up your awareness of the outside influence of people saying oh but go on be that or be that it's like mm. well, nah fuck it like, I am yeah. who I am you know? what, what is the you move uh, back off to London 17, 18? Se- 17 yeah what made you want to go back over? Uh, do you know what it was I finished school um, and I remember I had like a couple of months before I did my leaving, so uh, I supported Plan B. Um, and I remember, I remember we were down, it was in the back of, I think it was Whelan's. We were down one of the, like outside his dressing room, and there was a load of us freestyling in the hallway. And he came out, and I think he might have started freestyling with us or whatever. We were having a little, like, you know, a little wrap off or whatever it was. And, uh, and he said to me, he just came up to me, he was like, um, yeah, you know, I've got this MySpace competition. You know, I think you should enter it. And I was like, oh yeah, but what? What's it for? And it was like, oh, it win. You win a day in a studio with him, and he comes in and you write a song with him and shit. And I was like, oh, that sounds wicked. And uh, the competition was it was two instrumentals from his album. You record your own minute and a half version, or whatever it was. You upload it, and then his team judge who's the best, and then you win a day in the studio in East London with him. Yeah, and. Uh, and I remember DJ Moke at the time was nudging me like, have you fucking got it done yet? I'm mean, yeah. for fucking procrastinating at the best of times. So I remember him nudging me, nudged me the night before. And anyway, I did it, sent it in and it ended up winning. And um, I was, I just finished school. I, I didn't fucking do well in my leaving so. And as school goes, when I said to him, you know, in career guidance or whatever, oh, I want to be a musician, they were like, yeah, don't think that's going to work. Do, <laughs> yeah. do sound engineering. And I was like, fucking sound engineering. It was like 420 points. You needed honours level physics, all this. So I ended up doing physics from me leaving. So having to go down to pass, I was sh- horrible at physics, yeah? I, like, I got 320, didn't get enough of the course, whatever it was. So I was like, fuck it, I'm going to start working for a bit, save up a bit of money, and then figure out what I'm going to do. And um, that summer then, before I started working, I went over, stayed with my nan, who was living in Hackney. Um, and I went over and I was like, I'd won this day in the studio. I was like, fuck it, I'm going to be over in July. Came and met him. And uh, so we had the session and I started singing in the session. He hadn't heard me singing. And he was like, oh, what, you sing as well? He was like, what are you doing? After the session at the end of it, and I remember this vividly, he was like, Yo, what are you doing? Like, what, like, what's your plans? And I was like, oh, you know, I think I might do like one of them, I don't know what they're called here. It's like, is it, was it like a B-Tech course or something like... Um, like, like FOSS, is it? Yeah, no, nah, it's like a course to get into another course. Cause I PLT. Didn't an, something like that, yeah. And I was going to do like computer tech. Or f- I didn't even fucking have a clue what the course was, but I was going to try and do something to get into sound engineering because that was the only thing. Uh, you know, college-wise, that there was a route for. And I was like, but to be honest, I'm not inspired by it at all. And I kind of want to come back here. And he was like, even though it sounds mad cliche, he was like, wh- he was like, why have you got a backup plan? And I was like, I don't know. And he really put it on me. He was like, no, nah, but why have you got a backup plan? Because he was like, you know what that's going to end up turning into? He was like, that's going to end up turning into you only playing the guitar at the weekends when you're finished from work. Mm. And I was like, fucking hell. He was like, do you want that? Or do you want to just go for it and go, at least I went for it. So plan B, ask him why you have a plan B. <laughs> yeah. Basically. Yeah, plan B yeah, saying yeah. stick to the plan A. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. And uh, and that conversation, because he's a straight straight talker, it was like, I came home that night to my nan's and I was like, fucking hell yeah, fuck this. What am I doing? Why have I got a backup at all? Like, So anyway, I went home. I was like, right, I'm going to walk for a couple of months, save up some money. My aunt had a spare room going in West London. And I saved up enough money. As soon as I had enough money, a couple of months later, I just packed my bags one day and just booked a boat and came over. And that was the changing point. And plan B was like, um, he was like, look, if you do make the move, I've got a room for you. I've got a studio for you. You can have, you can be around my friends. We'll introduce you to London properly. And that's, he stuck to his word and I stayed with my aunt for a bit. I lived with him for a bit. He was recording Strickland Banks at the time. 
um, and he was walking on Ill Manors, the movie. Mm. And he just basically brought me into his group of friends and, you know, his family and, you know, uh, yeah, kind of like introduced me to London. So, yeah, I moved back at 17 and, and that was my experience. He gave me studio late at night when he'd finished it. So I used to go into the studio around 10, 11 at night and walk till 4 or 5 in the morning. Free studio space in West London. Sometimes I would sleep on, you know, his couch or a spare room or whatever. And uh, and then en loads of his close friends ended up becoming my close friends. One of them ended up being a guy whose mum was from Wexford and he'd been brought back and forth. The opposite of what I had, but we'd never met. We had mutual friends, but never met. He ended up being brought up in East London, musician, played guitar for him. We're like best friends now. We make music together and for the last, you know, 10 years. And it just ended up blossoming into something beautiful. And then that's kind of where everything kicks You obviously saw real talent in you, though, Maverick. And for him to give you that opportunity... Although, like, for a long time, it would have been a struggle for you. Like, you would have been staying in your, in your nan's house or, or yeah. wherever. Like, they still gave you a real opportunity there. So we've seen something in you, no matter how long it was. And it's so early in your career. You know what I mean? So he didn't have to do that. No. And sometimes you just need that help and hand off somebody. Just to kickstart you and then, and then you can run on it and proper go for it. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, and sometimes you just need that. It's like, as much as we have self-belief in ourselves, and that should be the grounding of what we, what we need to... You know, we shouldn't necessarily need any outside validation, but at that point and at that point of any of our fucking lives, even if it's not creative or whatever it is, for someone to go, lad, I see the direction here. Here's a little help in hand. You didn't need to do anything. You mm. benefited not and off it. It was just for the love, yeah. you know, and then he brought me on my first ever tour. And, you know, I remember being on tour with him and Strickland Banks just came out with She Said and all them big tunes and it went number one when we were on tour and all the venues upgrade and it was just like, I was still a kid and we were all kind of still young anyway, you know, and, um, and he changed my life with that, you know, and then he just gave me a mindset to go, I, I have to carry on this tradition and I've always tried to maintain that for the rest of my career of like giving a helping hand or a bit of advice or or just like, you know, an ear to listen to um, for younger artists because I'm like, that changed me completely. You know what I mean? Mm. Yeah, it goes a long way. Sometimes you don't even understand how much that deal for somebody, a younger artist coming up, even just a conversation or a bit of advice because that advice he gave you obviously mm. went a long way. You know what I thought? Have you ever done that other than music? For me? Yeah, you personally. Now, only before I got into, before I started making money off music. So I was working in a restaurant and walked in a petrol station for a while, but yeah. that was it. So we saw the right fuck. And imagine, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah but imagine yeah, the yeah. weight, yeah. the weight that advice would have had for him, because it came from Plan B. Yeah, oh, bro, do you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, it didn't yeah. come from just anybody. Nah. Yeah. And I was like, you don't need to do this, and I look up to you as well. That's what so I mean. Like, yeah. And you're willing to do that. It was like, yeah, anyone that was willing at that stage, you don't even fucking know me. You've met me once, and in that one meeting, you've said, you know, at, at that time, he offered me, you know, a room in his mom's house. Mm. Oh, you've just met me one day and you've heard me spitting half a verse in Dublin. You don't fucking know. I could be, I could be anyone. I could be mental. Could be, yeah. Like, burn down the gap. You know what I mean? <laughs> but, yeah, lucky I didn't. But, uh, but I just found that, like, that, that perspective he had and gave me, I was like, yeah, that, I took that and I still carry that with me now, you know? Mm. What was the first single that you brought out? The first single that I brought out was, um, what would it have been? It would have been Sometimes. A song called Sometimes, which actually going back into the identity yeah. was, was all about my identity yeah. and kind of finding myself. Where you're from. And yeah, 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 and that was the first one. We did that independently when I was 19. I had my first manager at the time and we released that. Yeah, we released that independently to just like a, a distribution company. And then that, that was what kick-started everything because if you remember like Channel U back in the day on Sky, that we pushed that to Sky and it was that texting shit. So yeah. And then that just started kind of like building up heat, building up heat. And then I was on the road with Plan B at the time. And then that was kind of like all working and building up at the same time. And then it wasn't long after the Plan B tour that I started to get offers from, from labels coming. Yeah. So when did you decide to knock the rapping on the head and say, I'll go into the singing? Yeah, because it was a big change there, wasn't it? It was all hip-hop when you were younger. Right? Yeah. But then you're just like into kind of what you'd say, soul singing then, basically. Yeah, do you know what? It was a progression for me, really. It was like, it kind of started back here where I could always play guitar. Um, and and I just remember, I remember doing a gig once because I used to just bring my, seed, my, my instrumentals up on a CD, give it to whoever was front of the house and you tell them track one, track two or whatever like that. And I just remember 
I remember being at one gig and going, you know, I'm sitting down writing these lyrics. Some are heartfelt, some are not. Some are just like all over the place. And just remember like, ah, oh, certain people are only here listening to the beats. Like, are you hearing what I'm saying? And I was like, fucking hell, how do I slow this down a bit? And just because I enjoyed the stories that I was telling. That was what, you know, Illmatic and fucking, you know, uh, Blueprint and all that shit. That, that was what was inspiring me in Kalashnikov and mm. the, the sagas and Council State of Mind, Skinny Man. All like deep storytellers were what was inspiring me at the time. So I was like, how do I slow this down and get it into people's ears a bit more so you get pulled in by the stories? And I was like, fuck it, let me just start doing gigs of the same songs, but just over a couple of chords. And then that just started to resonate more with people and people came away and I was noticing that people were hearing the stories more rather than just going, yeah, that was a banging tune. I was like, oh, fucking hell, I, I appreciate that, that. That's how it's kind of seeping into people. Then I started singing more and then I, the transition from that was like, all right, instead of rapping, let me just put some melody into rapping. So it was the same cadence, it was the same flow. I was still writing it, rapping in the studio, I was still rapping the verses, but then when I was performing them, I was singing them a bit more. So same flow, but just singing them. And then I found that started to get people into it more and it started to broaden people. And I was doing, at the time, there was a big scene of open mic nights in London. So I was like, you turn up to these random different pubs and they kind of had their own following of people who go there on a Tuesday or Thursday night just for the open mic, whoever mm. the fuck was to turn up. And then as as I started to do more of them and just do the this, this circuit of that more, I noticed that people were warming more to me singing it and hearing it. And they were like, oh, yeah, that one lyric. And I was like, oh, shit, well, I wrote this as a rapper, but you're hearing it with a, just a bit of melody and kind of like I'm getting through my raps in a secretive way through your ears as a as a singing, you know, sped up singing verse or whatever. Uh, and then that just naturally progressed into to me singing, you know, kind of like ballads and soul tunes and stuff like that. But even on the first album, I never really, I never taught myself as a singer. I never really liked my voice or anything like that. <laughs> on the yeah. first album? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I never really, I always thought like, I like, obviously I like my, I'm my own biggest fan. Yeah. I never, whenever one, anyone used to ever call me a singer, I was always a bit like, I'd shy away from it a bit because I was like, nah, I'm not because I haven't trained to be a singer. And like, yeah. I was a spitter at heart. That's my passion. That, yeah. You know, that was what kind of brought me up. So I was like, yeah. And then that just gradually, as time went on, I found my tone through that, you know. Yeah. And you're saying that you, you brought your first single out when you were 19 mm. and you've done that independent. Yeah. So when did then you first sign to a label? So I first signed to a label when I was... I was 20. I think I was just yeah, 20. Surely yeah. it wasn't long after. No, it wasn't long after, yeah, because we were on the road with Plan B. That was all building up. And I was doing the circuit in London at the time, so like the open white nights, and then there was there was a couple of like, industry nights, like I Love Live and shit like that. And So there's no money in all that, is there? Nah, there's no money in no. that. Like the first bit of money I made from that was we did this night called I Love Live, and I remember doing... Um, I did the song sometimes and uh, I did it stripped back and the crowd went mad and I remember outside uh, there was loads of like artists that I fucking loved in there. There was like Rich 32, Kano, Chip. The and boys. I remember outside the first bit of money I ever made was Chip who ended up, you know, having a relationship and walking, you know, we, we made like loads of different types of music as the years went on but I'd never met him at this point. Uh, he came up to me outside and I love live, open mic gig. I was like, yeah, that song sometimes, da, da, da. He was like, how many CDs have you got? And I used to carry CDs in a backpack. I was like, I've got a ten, I've got 10 and there are 10 or each. And he just gave me a wad of money. Kind of, he might have given me like 160 quid. He was just like, yo, take that and let me take all the CDs. And that was my first bit of money. And I was like, hey, all right. So this is, <laughs> this is how this can move forward. Um, but yeah, that was That's good. some compliment as well to get from someone like him as well to go up there and say, give me them. Yeah, yeah. And at the yeah. time, again, it was all these little interactions that were meant a hell of a lot to me. You know what I mean? Because it was like pure love. It wasn't like... The industry can be a sharky place, as everyone knows. Yeah. To have to be introduced to it with interactions like that and love and just different ways. I took a lot from them and I learned a lot from them interactions. You know what I mean? Yeah. Who was the first label that signed you? So the first label that signed me was, um, it was called Mercury. It was under Universal. It was a Universal label at the time. Mm. And that was a DJ called DJ Semtex, who used to be, he's got a radio, he used to have yeah, a radio. Yeah, why do I know that now? He used to have a Radio 1 show. He was a DJ in his own right, had a Radio 1 show, and he used to DJ for Dizzy Rascal at the time as well. Yeah. I think it was MK and then him. 
uh, it was a guy called him who signed me and then a guy called Jamie Nelson who done like Lily Allen and a couple other big big yeah. acts um, and yeah we'd had some times out and that was kind of doing the rounds and we had a might have had a little a, a little EP independent that ended up having a couple of tunes that went on the first record um, and they came down to a couple of gigs there was a couple of other labels but they were they were the ones who won me over in the end mainly because of Semtex and I appreciated his kind of balance between hip hop and like the soul world and shit like that Um and yeah, so then signed, signed. I think it was just before I turned twenty or just before I turned twenty-one, something like that. It was in that age back okay. mm-hmm. then. Lonely of the Brave comes not long after that. Yeah, and then we yeah, so it wasn't long after that. We put out a song called "Look What I've Done," which was another single. We put out a mixtape, "Traveling Man" mixtape, um, and then I had like, who did I have on that? It was like I think Chip was on that, Rich was on that. Then we put out "Jungle" Pro, with Pro Green came out. Yeah. That was a big chill. Jungle that one. came out. That big came, yeah. chill. On that yeah. I think that came out just before I got signed. Actually, it's Bill Hackney as well. Isn't yeah, it? he's on. from yeah, he's yeah. From Hackney as well. Um, that tune came out and that blew up as well. And then uh, then we put out a mixtape and one single, and then built up to do the first single off the first album, which was Let Me Go. Mm. And then that kickstarted everything. Then. That's when your career proper kicks off. That's actually everything. probably where you start. Yeah, Jesus. yeah. It was it was probably the biggest notice was probably Jungle. When Jungle connected first, that was like sometimes was doing its rounds and I'd have people coming up to me and a couple of people coming to shows, like a handful of people coming to shows saying, like, I saw you on channel you and da 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 da. But it was when Jungle came out that I remember people going like I remember hearing it in cars driving by and shit like that. Yeah. I was like, oh shit, this this tune's connecting properly and the yeah. school kids were coming up to me and shit like that and um, and then yeah then when Let Me Go came out that was when it really that was it then that was it really yeah. that's when it that's when it really kind of kicked in can you remember the first time heard one of your songs on the radio or that yeah that was sometimes so that was yeah. when we were independent and I I'd, I would I no came back at that stage, yeah? yeah yeah and I was back I was back home for a bit or something and, and I remember listening to it on iPlayer or whatever it was and hearing it and it was a DJ called Sarah Jane Crawford who played it and uh and I remember it, yeah. I remember it vividly the first, because that was like, that's what we all built up for at the time. Yeah, you know, there yeah. was no like TikToks or Instagrams, yeah. right? And it was like, if you get played on radio, it was like, shit, this is a, this is kickstarting into something. So, yeah, that was the first one. So after Lonely Out of Rave comes out, you do what? Another two albums, is it? Two or three? Nah, so Lonely Out of Brave came out in 2012. <clears throat> we ended up touring that quite heavily for. Was it two years? So we were we were already torn from when the mixtape came out. We'd started torn pretty heavy. Uh, that was in 2011. Then the album came out 2012, and we kind of went straight into two years of torn. Um, and I didn't really make much music in that block of time, just because I was on the road all Still the time. Still busy, yeah. And uh, like it was the first time we were touring Europe, and kind of like. You know, that that took up a lot of space of time. And then we put out the second album in two thousand end of two thousand and fifteen. So that was still under Universal. But what happened at the time was in between my first album and my second album, <clears throat> Mercury Records went from being like quite a small subsidiary of Universal. At the time I think it was like me chasing status, uh U two Elton John there was only a small number of acts on it it went from that to being merged with EMI uh, Universal Records had bought uh, the, the record side of EMI and so they merged so my two A&Rs left the head of the label changed he went to Rock Nation or something like that and then a whole new team was kind of brought in there was one or two people that still remained the same but you know my point people there had kind of changed so the environment had slightly changed and uh, and then we put out the record the second album through EMI or still under Universal but through EMI with a different team and it just didn't really go that well and I wasn't really happy with it they weren't really you know no one was benefiting off the situation mm. so I came off the label at the start of 2016 I'd gone over to Australia. I'd done um, I'd done a couple of records with a hip hop group over there called Hilltop Hoods, um, and that that went number one out there. And so I went out touring that with them for a couple of weeks, and I came back and I just had a bit of a change of mind, and I 
I basically within a couple of weeks, I, I kind of came off management, I came off label, came off everything and just went independent mm. and then started the journey from there. And then everything since end of 2015, start of 2016 has all been independent. Yeah, because that's something that I noticed. Oh, yeah. I actually had a look at your, uh, your disc. Discovery, what do they call it? Discography, yeah. Discography, yeah. 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 And you see the dip in like 2016, it just goes cold and then yeah. it starts to come back then 2019. Yeah, yeah. So that's like, what was going on in that little gap there? So that was just a changeover. I think like the end of 2000, 2014 and 2015 were a bit like, for me, they were kind of tough years because it was like coming back into a new space with a new team. There was like a, a way of working that we had for the first record with the kind of unit of people that you have in any kind of business environment or whatever, when you've got a certain unit of people that everyone understands it, gets That's it. That's your team. Yeah, yeah. But when it changes and people get brought in and it's like, you know, chopping and changing all the time, my management had changed. I was then with Rocket Management, which was uh, Elton John's management company, and that was a bit chopping and changing in between. And um, all love and respect to everyone, but it was a bit of a chop and change period. And for me, I was trying to make a record in it and on a bit of a journey myself, I was still like, I was still on the fucking lash from the first album and, you know, dealing with my own personal shit in the background. Uh, and then at the end of 2015, I was like, mate, this record's not really connecting. It wasn't connecting for me anyway. It was like, I love the album, but it was just, there was a disconnect somewhere. Um, and then when I came off that tour, it was kind of like a shock coming back home because I come off the high and I came back home to the reality of like where my head was at with everything. And there was loads of change that I got kicked out of my flat at the time I was sleeping on my sister's couch. And and there was just load of, load of changes that happened. And I came back from Australia and I was like, all right, something needs to change here. And, and uh, in a weird way, um, a guy who gave me one of my first ever gigs in London ended up becoming my lawyer. He ended up becoming a really well-known lawyer in the UK for musicians. He ended up going into management and he was like one of my closest friends as well. So I always used to go to him with issues or problems I was having. And he kind of saw the industry from a different side. And he was like an artist friendly person that understood the creativity and also understood the business element of how artists were getting ripped off and wanted to kind of start up his own thing with a new ethos for being uh, artist friendly. And we kind of were sat down and having ideas and I was like, I want to get into writing more. Um, Cause I'd always done little bits of writing, but it was always for dance acts or like the Chasing Status or Gorgon City or whoever it was I was writing for. I was never really specifically writing for another artist for them to sing the whole song. Yeah. Um, and that's when he said, oh look, this was the end of 2015. I was kind of in that period of time. And he was like, look, there's this young girl that we found. She hasn't released any music, but I think she's going to be fucking massive. Here are some of our demos. I want to build a team of people that I like around her that I feel like can, you know, um, give her some nice songs, walk with her. She's a great writer, um, got a great voice. And just he kind of wanted to build a kind of wholesome family around her of people he trusted and that were good. Um, and that was Georgia Smith. And he played me a couple of our early demos. And I was like, yeah, this shit's hard because she was spitting at the time and she was sampling all hip hop beats. And then she was singing. She had like a bit of classical training. She still plays piano. Um, and then that, that kind of gave me a bit of guidance because I was like, all right, I'm really enjoying writing with someone. Mm. So for two years, I ended up just write, being a writer and not, not really, well, I didn't release any music. I did a couple of collaborations. I was on, like, the Joey Bad Yeah, that's what I was going to say. That, when I seen you with that, I was like, that's the like, least... I'd never put you two together. Yeah, Like, yeah. how the fuck did you end up with him? Joey, it was all, it was kind of like, again, it was all natural. Um, he was a, he put up, after his 1999 mixtape, which I loved, he put up uh, I Need Lyrics on his Twitter and then we messaged each other and he was like, cause he was still, he was pretty young then. He was like 17 mm. and he was like, Oh, I'm a fan. I'm coming over to London soon to do my first ever gig. And we actually met on stage performing. We, I'd done a song for his mixtape. It was called, uh, my youth. That was the first thing it was on. Uh, I can't remember the name of the mixtape. It was an EP or project that came out before the album. And we actually met no rehearsal or not. We met on stage doing the song, Class. built up a friendship with him. He was always coming back and forth to London. And then we did something for my next album. And then I did that tune for him. 
Um, and then that ended up doing really well. So there was a couple of collaborations in between that, but for my own solo stuff, I kind of like... Put a pause on I put a bit of a pause on it. I was like, all right, my aim was to go... I need to build up myself as a writer and make sure I'm getting in bigger and bigger rooms and sharpening the tools as well. Yeah. And like, it just put the pre took the pressure off me as well because I also didn't know what the fuck I wanted to make. I was kind of a bit disillusioned with stuff because I was like, I've put my heart and soul into the second album. There were songs off of that. I thought these are f massive tunes. Some of them connected, but not in the way that I felt like they were after yeah. the success of the first. So I kind of went into a bit of a isolated place with my own music and... You know, there was a period where I wasn't even singing on, I didn't even want to hear my voice for a period. I kind of like had a love-hate relationship with my own music. But then I refound that through writing for other people. Uh, and then in that process, I was in like pop sessions in the day, just kind of at the time I was throwing myself into everything, every extreme, like credible shit to extreme pop shit and just like going, fuck it, let me just try my arm at anything here. Um... And then in the evenings, I was making just wonky, psychedelic shit and just, like, as far left as I could make it. And then that ended up forming into me refinding. I felt like I was 17 again making beats, and I was like, oh, shit, something sparked back here. And then that all ended up being stuff that influenced the third album, and then that's when shit kicked out again for me. Yeah, back up and running again. Yeah. yeah. So what year did you go independent? 2015, 2016? End of 2015, start of 2016. And then that was just because the, there was a big shake-up in the team, so you were like... Yeah, I just didn't feel like it was the place for me anymore, and I just was afraid of being shelved and like sat yeah. there in this contract. I was five albums. It was a five album contract. I'd only released two, and I just you hear all the horror stories yeah. about artists that sit on labels for years, can't release music, can't do anything. I'm like, nah, I've still got drive in me. I'm not ready to like just give this up and go. All right, I've had my run. It's like, nah, fuck that. I didn't. I haven't been doing this this long to just give up here now. So, um. I just felt like it wasn't a place for me anymore. And I felt like I would have died a lonely death if I would have stayed on it. And it just was like, you know, my last my last meeting in Universal was with something I'd ne someone I'd never met before. <coughs> mm. So it's like, all right, I'm having my end of contract meeting or whatever with someone that I've never even met before. Strange, eh? he head of A&R. It's like, that says exactly what, you know, the reason why I'm, this isn't working out for either of us. And no shame to anyone, it's all business, it's, it is what it is, but for me, I had to make that decision of, like, I needed needed a bit of a change up, you know. Mm, do you ever think about doing a collab or, like, a, like a house project with a DJ or something like that? Because a few of your tunes, the way our vocals are, they've been remixed, and the remixes just work perfect. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> do you yeah. ever think about doing that? Because I heard Jake Boog before I was saying that, his music, he done a thing with Camel Fat. Yeah, yeah, I remember, and, and it blew up, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it blew up, but he said his back catalogue blew up more then because yeah. it reintroduced people back to his music that either some people missed it when it came out or may have been too young. Yeah, yeah. But, like, it works perfectly. Uh, well, and you know what it is? It's like, we always used to do this thing where every single we put out, like, four or five remixes, so we'd do, like, a drum and bass, a house remix, a fucking grime garage remix or whatever, because they live at different points of the day. Not everyone's going to listen to a soul tune at fucking four o'clock in the morning when they've come back from a party. They yeah. might yeah. might listen to that tune with a, with a bit of a fucking yeah. beat underneath it. And that always seemed to work well. And the little bits that I did with... Chase and Status or Gorgon, Gorgon uh, City or Shy FX or whatever, they always connected. So, yeah, and then again recently with Slowdown, yeah, that got this mental remix in lockdown. And yeah, it's ended class. Up, and it ended up blowing up off his own back. And so, yeah, they're funny. I'm actually doing something here this week with um, uh, Jake Hall, who is an English designer. He runs a brand called Preview. Um, and we did a little collaboration early on in the year where we he brought me in and kind of like basically taught me how to like self design and we we designed uh two suits that we ended up selling for uh charity Pieta House in Ireland and I think it's Cam Mental Health Charity in, in Ireland. But we're getting into a project because he was always a fan of my shit but always wanted to hear me on more house shit or dance stuff. And he's like, nah, we need to you know, I'd be sat around him. He's like, nah, we'd be playing house tunes. I'd be singing on him or whatever. And he's like, we need to do a project. So, yeah, there's something in the pipelines coming. Something interesting between fashion and music. And uh, yeah, we're we're gonna be releasing like a like a yeah a new a new project with that with is, that in the forefront of it. Is there some day you're not allowed? You're not allowed to anymore, is it? No, nah, we're not. I can say what I want. We're calling it. We're sorry. Yeah, that sounds real secret. No. <laughs> yeah, I was like, <laughs> what's, what's going on now? Is, is he not in the pen? Undisclosed time, faceless. <laughs> no, nah, um, yeah, we're calling it a project. It's it's called yours, 
um, with the idea of having a you know a family run thing. We've got a producer who ended up. Uh, um, he was the guy I was telling you about that his mom's from Wexford right. basically had the opposite upbringing to me back and forth to Ireland at uh, summers and Christmases and we've been walking together for years and he's producing it he's a wicked producer um, and we've just kind of come together collectively with the idea of I was like look you've brought me into your factories and shown me how to design pants and like what I like about and giving me the language of fashion or whatever right I was like you love dance music yeah he's introducing me to all this like, mad house shit that I'd, I'd never really been into or I'd never really been listening to. I was like, just come to the studio and try some shit because we're all musicians in one sense. That's my belief anyway, yeah? Like, we've all got some kind of musical talent in us, whether it's us being spoken word artists or you like a certain rhythm or you can direct, you might sit me down here and play a playlist and that'll inspire me. That's musical. That's an mm. old school producer. So we started bringing him into into sessions and got him like doing it like cockney phrases over stuff like that and it's like oh there's a tune this is how you can make a tune same way you taught me how to make a pair of pants it's like it's as easy as that it's the language of music in it so that's what we're building we're trying to build a little bring back that kind of like maloco uh ear of like you know dance funk house all mixed together and just feel good stuff you know and you have a you were telling us you have a hard drive full of rap songs unreleased. Yeah, yeah, I've got a whole, yeah, whole, I've got not just rap songs, I've got like, I've got a folk album, I've got a couple of dance records, I've got like, yeah, loads of, loads, but rap songs, I've got untold amounts of them that I've never put out. And what's the plan you for have them? A little trick for them, though. Yeah, I do have a little trick. When I said you're up here, I'm having come on. Will yeah, you? I do have a little <laughs> trick for them. So with one, uh, one of the t-shirts that we're releasing for the tour for the ten year anniversary, we're going to do a little thing that with every purchase of the t-shirt, you get a little code, and you get a, a free download to just a free project. It's random. It's fucking sketches, but I just want people. I just want <laughs> people. Sketchy. It's sketches, but I want people to bring bring into the world of like, nah, do you know what? I was having a conversation with someone recently, just another musician, and like most of our ideas, I'd say 90% of musicians' ideas, no one ever hears because they're on hard drives. It's like, oh, oh, I've got this single out, we can't release anything for three months. It's like there's little bits of gold that we might not be able to put into an album or they might not fit onto that, but they can fit onto something else. So I kind of want to bring people into a little world of just like a little beat tape, like old school mixtape vibes. I think it's an unbelievable idea. Yeah, I yeah. think it's Because you've never heard of something like nah. that, you know, the type of way. Nah. And then, like, do these songs date back far? Some of them do. So, yeah, some of them, like... Probably from your early days. Yeah, because I brought... When I moved over at 17, I brought over all my old, old lyric books as well, so I had everything, and then some of them I re-recorded. Some of them are sketches from, like, five, six years ago. Some of them are recent sketches. Like, every couple of months, I probably do about four or five... Um, tunes like just rapping tunes alone just to kind of keep me sharp mm. um, so there's all of them to choose from so I'm going to do a little project of that and that's like out. quality that is as well. when you said that to me out there I was like that is such yeah. a genius idea like. and it's just to get the ideas out it's like fucking hell like what am I going to do I could sit here and be having the same conversation which is in 10 years and it's like what am I waiting for? Yeah. You know I mean? And people buy the T-shirts. Yeah, and yeah. people buy the T-shirts as well. <laughs> and it's like, I want people to be brought into an experience that it's like, yeah. I, you know, it's about interaction with fans and I think like, from going back, being independent again, it's like learning these little things, relearning these things of like, you know, it's not major label thing, it's about reconnecting with fans and, it's kind of what people do on the Instagram and TikTok year of like, you know, interaction. I kind of want to bring it back to the old school of like, yeah, there's interaction, but it's physical interaction. It's like, oh, come here, buy a T-shirt. You've got, you know, it's the experience of it. You go buy it and you, you feel like you're part of the journey when you download a project. And it's just like, you're basically getting brought into my living room, sat yeah. around the beats yeah. that I yeah. make. And there'll yeah. be a lot of people out there who haven't heard you rapping. Nah, 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 nah. And they'd be big fans, you know? Yeah, yeah. So and I want people to, because it's, it's part of the story. It's like, you know, bringing people into that world a bit more. And it's all my own beats as well. So it's like, yeah, just bringing, bringing people in as much as they can. Yeah, Camille, what's the pros and cons to being independent? Because, like, obviously, when you're showing to a label and a major label, mm. it's literally the click of a button and boom, you're out there. And yeah. Let's say famous, or they can fucking throw you out there at the click of a button. Yeah. And then being independent, obviously... There's a lot of shit you have to deal with yourself. You're your own boss, basically. Yeah, but you have to fund it yourself as well, though. Isn't yeah, it? That, they're, they're, they are they're the, the basic pros and cons. It's like, well, you're free. But yeah. you're free. It's like the pros of a major is they are a well-oiled 
uh, they're a well-oiled business that knows when to push the buttons, has already built up relationships within radio and TV and whatever marketing that they know how to push the red button. And there is, you know, when that red button's pushed, it can, you know, it can expand things. Obviously, the, the, the cons to it are that it's not your team, in essence, if that makes sense. It's like, say, for example, what I said about I had my set team of there people around me. There's a switch up, and then next minute, for no control of your own, you don't have them point people. Mm. So rather than, you know, uh, be getting used to having someone that can go and fight your battles in there that believes and understands in your music to then someone who doesn't get it and has just been handed your work, like, oh, you're the new disc to, the, to him. That water sings down, you know, and it's already... As a creative, depending on how headstrong you are, to bring your ideas into a major record label also then has to get passed through people that either like it or don't like mm. it, or has to sign off, because they have to sign off the checks in the end of the day. So if it's a 25 grand budget video and you have a, an idea for it, they might say, well, we don't agree with that idea, so we're not signing it off. So then... Does it get look, kind of get... It can, like, yeah, yeah. yeah. I had, I had, I've had moments of it like where certain ideas didn't go down well or they didn't understand it and you know everyone comes in you know no shame to anyone everyone comes in on their own business angle of yeah. it but then it's difficult as a creative sometimes because you lack the freedom because you don't you don't necessarily own your creations anymore. yeah I think that's madness as well yeah. like you know like some people can't even sing their own songs in the end because they don't own it yeah it's like we were having a discussion outside we were saying about like Krepton Conan who most people know of, like you know has, has had ma massive success uh, they came out with something recently and it's, you know, it's on top of loads of other conversations. I think like Taylor Swift started it by doing the re-records and Taylor's versions of all her own albums because she couldn't buy back her own her own recordings. So she re-recorded everything. And Crept and Conan, um, Crept came out recently and, you know, was saying he hadn't been paid royalties in nine years. You know, they ma they had massive tunes and it opens up the conversation back into ownership and control. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, most of us sign deals and don't necessarily understand completely we might know the words and uh recouping and royalties at the time but most of us being young and some of us seeing money like that for the first time it's like you get taken away with stuff and you think oh it's constantly going to keep rolling when really in the background you don't completely understand the business elements of it and potentially you could be stuck where you might have success but you're constantly paying back a debt yeah. because of the way deals are set up um, and then you don't own your music yeah. because someone owns an 80, 20% share, 80% in their favour of your music, you know, and then you bring that back into conversations about ideas for videos or stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it can it can be watered down, you know, and the positive of being independent is, yeah, you have to put up your own money. You know, you can work with distribution companies and get little loans out of fair loans and stuff like that and work at it like a proper business um, if you need that or if you've got enough money to put up front. And, you know, but either way, it's your own complete control because you sign off everything. So... The only con to that is that, and it's not really a con, it's, it's, I suppose it's just a learning curve, is you become a business. Mm. So you have to learn the balance of the hat of being a businessman and then the hat of being a creative. So it's just balancing that because you sign off everything. You know? yeah. That's what I was going to ask you. Like, what is the advice to a younger artist coming up? Because obviously coming up, like if a label comes in, yeah, a big major label comes in, yeah, and, and they cough up, well, well this the check will give it the same or us. But mm. we'll take this now from from everything going forward. Let's say eighty twenty, as you mm, said. Mm. It's hard for a young kid, especially it's a lot of young fucking kids who come up with nothing yeah. that get into this and they're actually legit yeah. real talents. Yeah. And they've never seen that type of money, and they see the money and they go, oh, I probably won't see that again. Boom, 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 sign, and now yeah. we're stuck there for five albums. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So what's you're saying? Just, just uh, I would say right now has been is probably the most interesting time for young artists because, you know. Do you have so much exposure? Because you have so much, much exposure. It's like, what would have been 10, 15 people sat around the boardroom, all their jobs are in your phone now. It's like, I remember one of the last meetings I had at Universal going in and, and speaking to them about marketing and stuff. And they were like, oh, da 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 was in beforehand. And they were on their phones all the time. We think you should be interacting on your phones. And I'm like, all right, fair enough. I understand that. But then that means that I'm doing a job that I'm paying a percentage for, yeah. that doesn't make sense. I could be doing this myself. Yeah. So for young artists now where that's even blown up 10 times, it's like, you balance it, right? It's like, if you're an independent, if you can go the independent route and you can like, 
you can if you can grab an audience using Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, or whatever it is, and you've got a constant fan base that's growing, you can make that into a business in its own sense, and you can constantly keep evolving that. And you're the controller of your own narrative. And you're directly in contact with your fans and you know exactly what they want. You mm-hmm. know exactly what content they feed back on. You know exactly what kind of tunes they connect with because you're in direct contact with them. And then you build that up and you build up a 1,000 fans, 2,000 fans. They are there for life because now they are part of your network that you've built up, right? For me, I think you've got to balance that up with it's a lot longer, the journey, Depending, everything's fast now. That can be quicker. But yeah. um, you've got, like, you know, the Central Seas, the Stormzy before he signed, um, Georgia Smith. They, these are all, you know, show what you can be done, what can be done as being an independent artist and gradually building stuff up. Mm. Um, the majors aren't a complete write-off. You know, there's some great people that work in major record labels and there's some great success stories out of it. But I think knowing that you've got the power of this now, which we didn't have 10, 15 years ago, the, 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 the stories or the roots for being independent 10, 15 years ago, for me anyway, didn't really exist. Not existing, yeah. It wasn't like, oh, you can build up your own fan, but you could do it a bit, but it wasn't like, there wasn't enough knowledge for me back then or for most artists to go, all right, that's an actual, yeah. fe- that's a feasible a place to go into. So the artist has more power now. More power. So it's like, really, we shouldn't be signing 80, 20 deals. If you come in 50, 50 and, you know, there's not as big of a check up front. If someone's offering you a million quid, think about what money they're calculating they can make off you in the bank. Yeah, definitely. So if you're worth that, then you've got bargaining, uh, uh, you know, more bargaining mm. to come into these conversations. And it, it, it shouldn't be as imbalanced. And we should also know that if the independent route's here and you put up this money to get this bag, then know what you're getting into in majors. Know that if you're spending 25 grand on a video, you have to pay that back. None, nothing's free. You know, you could put up a quarter of that of your own money and you make back money quicker if you do it independent. Mm. You know, but that's not to say that deals can't be struck with majors, but it's just, I think young artists have a lot more bargaining tools right now. Yeah, than yeah. Should go into no, I definitely hear what you're saying, but there's, look, where a lot of them major yokes, they don't really give a fuck about you on a personal level. So nah, there's a lot of sharks big, there, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. The business. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Do you know that type of way? So that's why. Yeah, and, yeah. It's a, and it's a business, and it's like, I think a lot of young artists get fucked over because we come in a bit wet behind the ears where, because we're creatives, most of us weren't necessarily business minded because that's the way our brains work. We're throwing paint at the wall or just singing tunes in a room all day. We're not really necessarily thinking about the financial background to anything. Yeah. So, yeah, I think if you're going to go into them situations, know your business and know your, know your, um, know your power that you're bringing into this and know your options as well. It's like, you know, people will shark you in this and they will see that because they see how naive young artists can be. Yeah. So. It's that Macklemore song, Jimmy Oivin. Did you ever heard that? Yeah. Nah, nah. About signing the label. He gets okay. off with a record label. And it's a little tune, yeah. Oh, bollocks. He, he gets off with a record label anyways and he says, well, I thought this was... Oh, I thought this was what I wanted. I'd rather be a starving artist than succeed at getting fucked. Turns it down. Stays yeah. independent. Yeah, and it's like loads of people have been screaming this for years. Prince was obviously, Prince was a big advocate for owning your own masters. And I remember there was a story, I think it was like Nas or something, uh, said, oh, yeah, Prince wants to walk with you. There was some discussion and Prince was like, I won't, wa- I, I won't walk with you unless you own your own masters. He was like, because he's trying to, he was trying to pull people into the discussion of ownership and it should be like, should be a long... If it's business, you know, which it comes down to sometimes in conversations about any of these subjects, it's like, all right, well, if it's business on a major side, then it should be business on our side, so we should come into that. If that's mm. the excuse of artists getting lost in the system or whatever, or like, oh, it's all up front, it's just business, then that should be our approach as well. It's like, nah, these should be partnership deals rather than someone, you know, having to recoup back for... Say you get given a, a hundred, hundred grand or a hundred grand spent on a record... If it's 80-20 for every £100 that the song or the album makes, they take their £80 in their pocket and then that 100 grand, 100 grand is recouped back off your £20. So You're in a forever debt. So maybe. potentially they've made their money back however many times over and you're constantly in that debt for that 20% and yeah. only ever able to pay it off through that. So, yeah, again, it's business, but for me what I wanted to spark off in these conversations is the understanding for a young artist to hear something like this and go, oh, shit, do you know what? I actually might 
come into this and with, with a, a different bit, mindset, a, yeah. A slight bit wise. And yeah. there is big examples out there. Didn't Chance the Rapper win a bleeding Grammy without being signed? Chance the Rapper, yeah. And then and there's then, that Frank Ocean thing where he released a Dot album to get himself out of a deal yeah. and released a Popper album the next day. Yeah, Legend. and then <laughs> that's big brand. That's I know he, I know we brought him up a couple of weeks ago and he's in the news for the wrong reasons. Well, Kanye West is always going on about this. Yeah, he's always yeah. pulling up pictures of his contracts and saying, "Look what I'm signed into." Like, yeah, there's a lot more conversations getting brought up recently, and I think it is just like people realizing that, you know, as the world has become more, you know, centered around what the control of yourself, like the phone and the internet has changed the game for like businesses or podcasts or musicians of like... Well, everything is transparent now. It is, yeah, yeah. You know? Even you when be... you see conversations happening on the telly and then you go onto Twitter, you get what happened in the background. Yeah, right. Like, well, this is what happened backstage and you're like, oh, all right. So you get even, you get another layer to the story then. And it's yeah. the full spectrum and if you can get into that and analyse it and use that to, for marketing or how to connect with people through your music or whatever you're selling to people, then it's like... That's quite a lot of gravity to be able to do mm. that and pull your people in that, you know? Yeah. So, just going back a little bit, because yeah. I know we're a bit into the podcast now. We don't want to keep your hair all all bleeding. Oh, no, I, and I can fucking talk all day. Like, <laughs> that coffee's just like... <laughs> do you want any water? Man? No, no, I'm all right for a minute, yeah. Um, you were saying, obviously, it took a couple of years off because you were writing for mm -hmm. George Smith. Yeah. Basically, for George Smith. <clears throat> yeah. How good is George Smith? Ah, she, mate, I remember, like... Um, I remember hearing her for the first time. It was like four o'clock in the morning. My friend uh, played me four of her tunes. I'd just come back after a night out and he was like, yeah, what do you think of her? And, and like, it sounds cliche, but man, I was blown away straight away because it was like, she was making her own beats. She was singing beautifully. She was spitting at the time. And like, she was speaking about love, like, and politics and society. And she was only 15. And I was like, oh, the way, the approach and the perspective you've got on this is, is, uh, is quite mature and fascinating. So I was like, yeah, and she's brilliant, man. And it's just been, do you know what? I'll have a little glass of water as well, please. Yeah, no, what I wrote. And it's been the first career, apart from my own, that I've kind of seen from... So obviously you'd have a really close relationship. Ah, bro, that's before. my little sister. Yeah. That's my little sister to death, man. Uh, yeah, it's just the first first artist and journey that I've been around, apart from my own, that I've literally seen from no one knowing her. What is it that you're at to her? Like, you, you were just writing songs for her? Like? Just writing songs, man. Like, and then and then we release we release under the same, the same kind of label name, Fam. Right. Uh, which is something um, our manager Zubin set up, who's... Uh, there's any and my shell under it and me and George are released under that. And it's just a family unit of artists. We all make make music together. We go on the road together. We just did our first fam night. Um, and I was hosting it and Georgia did a set, any did a set, I did a couple of tunes. And yeah. It's just like a collective basically trying to break the mould of of uh, you know, of doing away in do, doing doing the um a label setup in the way that is more centered around friendly to, to, to artists and that, that creative process and the softness around that. And it's like what you're saying, it's more personal what you have there. It's like, you actually know each other, you want to work with each other. Yeah, you you're, in a, you're in it together, yeah, in a yeah. proper yeah. team you have. Yeah. yeah, bro, it's like me and, me and George will always make music. It's like, yeah. you know, from the, from the first EP that she ever put out, I was on, she ended up bringing me on, you know, tour in the States I hadn't actually properly toured the States before I went on the road with her and then she's coming back on and did something for my last album and then that blew up with Slow Down and it's like we've constantly we're constantly in rooms creating together so it's just like yeah we're, we've got quite a similar outlook on what we're inspired by and, and, and kind of the music that we want to make as well so you know, we we create a lot and quite easily as well. Flash, you know? yeah. I know I'm going to take a right back, but something caught me at the start, yeah, mm. but you got into a flow, and I, I, I said to myself, I better call him back, because I know I, we're really pushed for time. Yeah. But you said you grew, you were born in England. Yeah. You moved over here, you, you basically grew up here. Yeah. You went back to England when you were 17. Yeah. And then you said you came back here and you got stuck here. Yeah, yeah. What yeah. did you mean by stuck here? <laughs> no, it's a funny story, so... Because I was like, how'd you get stuck in Ireland? <laughs> yeah, nah, so uh, I remember it was, um, I was staying with, with Plan B at the time and, and I was like, I'm going to go back for my 18th birthday, yeah? And he was like, <laughs> it's like a bloody, what's it like, uh, Psychic Susan or whatever the mystics are. He was like, he's like, mate, I'm, gonna, I'm telling you, don't fucking go back, something bad's going to happen. I was like... Shut, look, I need to go back anyway, yeah? He was like, look, mate. He was angry. He was like, something bad's going to happen. Whatever. I was like, mate, 
Anyway, went back for my 18th birthday and I ended up getting into a fight. I ended up getting nicked. Uh, I ended up waking up with... Uh, I ended up waking up with an assault and a police officer charge and then ended up just having to be in court for a while over it. And ended up getting dismissed, but, yeah, I ended up not being able to kind of go back to England for a while, and that's when I started walking in the petrol station. I ended up starting... <laughs> I ended up starting my first day in the petrol station. I came in with, like, a broken nose and two black eyes and said it was just that. And then, yeah, that kind of... Which I ended up walking out, actually, in my favour yeah. a slight bit, in a weird way. Um, and then that just gave me even more motivation to go, all right. Head once, down now. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. I was like, what the fuck am I doing? was the plan, babe? I left for you, man. Nah, oh, oh, mate, when I rang... Why did he say that? I don't care. I don't know. I don't know. He just could... I don't know what he could sense. He's obviously got... In fairness, he, he knew you were coming back here for a hooli. Probably, you know what I mean? Yeah, but that yeah. doesn't mean... Yeah, but... That's like saying, don't give a kid an 18th or he's going to batter a copper. Uh, no. Nah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, yeah. he, he has him on the right track. He's focused. He's in the studio. And then he's like... You're going to deviate from that now. You're going back to have a hooli with oh, all your mates. Slay, hard, calm, yeah, but lock, there is that, but like, he's had <laughs> to take you he over. Knew, he knew by the yeah. fucking look at me there. <laughs> he, he took your Audi and for him and he had you on the right path and then he's like, I oh, know if you go back over there, you're going to get a taste for something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, think I can see where he's coming from. Yeah, maybe that's because I'm a lot older than you, 30. Yeah, and, and I think maybe more so his fear was that I would never come back. Mm. Not that anything necessarily bad would happen in that sense, but more that I'd get into the comfort of being home. Yeah, like, well, that happened. Fall yeah, back a into a plan B yeah. or whatever, you know what I mean? Wait, what, were you normally getting into trouble? Like... Not really, not, nah, not really. Nah, bits and pieces. Bits and but, pieces. Bits and pieces. Nah, 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 nah. Yeah, like, yeah. bits and pieces, but... Um, yeah, I, I definitely went through a period of time, and then probably even more so when I, when stuff started kickstarting in the UK. I, I, yeah, I got myself into a bit of trouble, mm. but that was just kind of me finding my way and being like out on nights out and getting a bit aggressive Don't and stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Had a statue of limitations gone now. We are nah, fresh, bro. Yeah, 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 yeah. So there was a couple. Yeah, there was definitely a couple of things I definitely didn't. I didn't really 100 percent learn from that experience. That more kickstarted me and going fucking hell like. I've come home. I can't do this. Mm -hmm. like, I need to. I need to get back to England. And don't get me wrong. Like when stuff started kickstarting in, in uh, with a career in England, I definitely still had an element of young fucking aggression about me yeah. um, that got me into a bit of trouble. But yeah, that I had to curtail that pretty quick. Yeah, you take her out on the mic now and said, <laughs> take it out on the mic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You just can't. Me, I was doing stupid shit like going to bloody Rihanna after parties and all this shit like 19, 20, 21 and getting into fights outside and getting slapped in the face and whipping me top off and just doing stupid shit yeah. that like, mm. I wasn't even that good of a scrapper so I'm yeah. just like, they are, like <laughs> shouting bollocks in the street getting punched in the face and then, oh, it's just you know, awful stuff, man. I was just yeah. like, yeah, I can't, I can't do this. It's, you all do stupid things when we're young though, you know what I mean, man? Yeah, it's part of it. Like, yeah. I'm glad I did that, and I'm glad that like I'm glad that shit got out of me. Shape shit, like. yeah, yeah, of course. You learned, you know I mean? yeah, yeah, definitely. And sometimes them hard lessons are the best ones. So. Yeah. And then the last thing that caught me eye was also I didn't actually assault the police, a fucking officer. Ah, look, we know yeah, the story. The bastards, <laughs> the bastards had me up for something I never did, but anyway. Yeah. No wonder we slayed the guy. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> we touched yeah, the nerve at the yeah, start. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> fucking hell. Now we know plenty of people have like the couple go to grab their arm and they move it, and they're like you just hit me, and I'm like what assault charge? But yeah, yeah, but anyway. Yeah, funny yeah. story. You said about uh, Taylor Swift <laughs> going back and re-recording her album. Yeah. Now that she was out of contract, is that what motivated you to do this? Or are you just doing it because it's a 10-year anniversary? No, nah, it started off because it was a 10-year anniversary. You know, I was like, I was thinking about ways of redoing the album or... At the start, I was going to like do a whole new version of it and take the songs and kind of make them into like new new songs and then, and coming having more of these conversations about control and ownership and stuff like that. It just didn't feel right to go back in and and redo the songs in different ways. I was like, I love that first album. Even if now I would maybe make them a bit differently, I was like, but I love the way I made them then. And I kind of want to have control over that first bit, it, it, you know, from having two albums that I completely own myself and seeing the rewards and the positive shift creatively that it's inspired me from, I was like... Looking back at my catalogue, I felt a bit of a way about not having, you know, control mm. over it. And when we looked into the background of it, it was like, I basically haven't been, not basically, I haven't been paid any royalties from any of them two records. Um, from even all this, you know, massive successful songs off it, I'd still never been, That's shocking, never been that? paid any royalties on the, on the recording side of that. Um, and then when we looked back into the accounts, it was like, I wouldn't make money off this for 40 years. So it's like, if I'd only... 
I was thinking to myself, it was like, if I look back at my young, naive self, if I would have come off to, uh, at the end of 2015 and been disillusioned and never made any music again, it would be, what, 40 years before I start making money off that? So, so that's not a career. I would have been fucked. So for me, it was more like, all right, I've got enough money now to be able to recreate the album, put it into market and put it into videos, put it into a relaunch. So I was like, and it sparks off the conversation. So I was like, yeah. basically went back in to try and record. Not everything's exactly the same, but I tried to get the thing sounding as close to the original as I could, just because I love the record. Yeah. With a couple of changes. Um, and I wanted to kickstart this conversation. For other people, I know there's loads of other artists in my position. It's like, do you know what? If you love your songs like that and you maybe think that they can have a life of their own or if it's even worth having a life of their own, give it a go. You know what I mean? So that's kind of where I'm at with that. Uh, so the tour did November? Tour did November. Lonely Had a Brave 2022 version is coming out, yeah. And are you going to hit the road for this one? Or? We are hitting the road, yeah. We're doing the Olympia on the 6th of December. I think it's the 6th. We're doing Birmingham, O2... Uh, Olympia, Manchester, uh, Albert Hall, and then two nights in Coco in London. Class. Yeah. Unreal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, buzzing for that, yeah. Yeah, it's going to be beautiful. It's like, yeah. you know, them songs mean a lot to me. And, you know, to bring, to even have a 10-year anniversary means a lot to me to be here for 10 years and yeah. for people to still be filling rooms and singing the songs back to me. Now, that, that means the world to me. So, uh, yeah, it's, to relive them songs from start to finish is going to be... It's going to be an interesting one. Yeah. And get the T-shirt as well for the lips. And get the yeah. T-shirt. It's the first yeah. thing. And you know what? We're doing these as well because I want to branch into other things. Oh, yeah. this? Look, he kept this quiet. We're doing, this, we're doing these. A friend of mine said, no, nah, we need to get Irish phrases. There's things you say. He's like, what's yolks? Okay. Oh, good luck. And, and I, was like, I was like, lad, yolks has loads of different meanings, yeah? <laughs> for everyone who knows what yolks But outside of Ireland, no one knows what yolks are. They're like, mate, what's yolks? <laughs> yolks are loads of different things. So we started our own, we started our own thing, which is yolks. <laughs> T-shirts, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because I was always like, I always take myself too seriously and it's like, you know, I've got to have the lyrics on the back and people got to have deep meaning. I was like, yo, there's loads of phrases that I say, so we've got these Yorks T-shirts that are going to get sold. We're doing a limited number, yeah. They've also got something secret that they come with as well. They come with Yorks. Yeah, no. <laughs> After bashing the garden, now they don't come with Yorks. Yeah. <laughs> Boy, in a T-shirt with a blue ghost on the back of it. Everyone at my show is going to be like, just speed the tunes up, will you? <laughs> get them House yeah, tunes yeah, on yeah, there, yeah. bro. I love this version, but can you get a house version on? <laughs> uh, <laughs> so um, yeah, we're redoing, we're redoing March. So we've got um, an I Need T-shirt with the handwritten lyrics on the back of every T-shirt. Class. Um, and then we're doing York's T-shirts, and we're doing a couple other things just to kind of like, like you were saying, bring people into the experience. It's like, all right, sweet. Let me just, let me try and expand this shit a bit more and Le further, further bring on the conversation about being independent and having different avenues of income and shit like that. Brilliant yeah. conversation that needs to be had as well. Um, have you got anything else you need to plug? Nah, there's a project yours that we're working on with J. Cole and New Machine and for anyone who's wanted any more dance shit out of me, we're starting off by putting some instrumentals out, launching them at ranges of clothes. That's going to be kind of building into me singing more on records. I'm doing loads more dance shit in the future. There's more stuff from Vintage Culture, Shy FX coming out. Little. Um and yeah, and then nah, nothing really else to plug apart from Lonely Out of Brave and just next year we were having this conversation about like the rapping project and shit like that and next year I kind of want to change up how I release music so instead of building up and saving music for an album I kind of want to go right here's a project every two three months of like here's five songs they may be just spitting tunes here's five folk tunes here's five mm. psychedelic tunes I was like yeah. just get back to like being more interactive with you know fans of music as a family in the end of the day and like Sometimes musicians can get into their own head and be like, oh, the album's not right. And people are like, oh, mate, just give us some fucking music. You know, <laughs> I don't want to wait three years for an album. And it's like, as soon as they listen, it's like, all right, let, where's the next one? It's like, all right, I need to try try something new. So again, further on the independent conversation about yeah. what's new ways of, of releasing and, and keeping connected with people. So yeah, that's it really, plug-in, plug -in ways. Yes. Yeah, right, Maverick. Maverick Saber, episode 99, hey. wrapped up fucking hell, mate. Unreal. Boys, yeah. I appreciate you having us on. Well, thanks for bro. coming in, mate. We really do appreciate it. Yeah, no, appreciate so that's it. it. We happy, Terry? Wrap yeah. up. Wrap. You happy, man? Love. Yeah, yeah. Right there. Yeah. Take us <laughs> out there, <laughs> Kino. Boom. Subscribe to this podcast for free on the Go Loud app. What you waiting for? Put your back in it. Just a little more. Try your in the now. Fill your body up in. Walk it high and low. When you finish that. The hip
knocker.